this oral history records Professor Kreider's contributions in three areas. The establishment of one of the most successful data storage, joint university, industry, and government research centers in the United States at Carnegie Mellon University, his tenure as chief technology officer at Seagate, and his contributions as an individual and leader to the advancement of data storage technology, especially prototyping, development, and commercialization of perpendicular magnetic recording, full disk encryption, and heat-assisted magnetic recording. I'd like us to start, uh, Professor Kreider, by uh, having you tell us about uh, your family background, uh, where you were born, where, where you grew up, and uh, which schools have you attended? All right. Um, well, you know, I, when I was, uh, I grew up at an, um, a little town called Milwaukee, Oregon, not Wisconsin, Oregon. It's, uh, and actually I lived well outside of Milwaukee, Oregon. Our address was Milwaukee, Oregon. So I, it was a rural area. Uh, Milwaukee, Oregon at that time had about 5,000 people in it. Mm. But I was probably five to 10 miles outside of Milwaukee itself. Um, and we had about five acres of land, all wooded. And uh, that was the mid 40s, would, was my first memories. And, my dad was a, an engineer, he was an electrical engineer at the Bonneville Power Administration, which, you know, does all the hydroelectric power in Oregon. Um, and uh, we, he built our house, uh, not in the way people talk about building houses today or having your house built. My dad built our house. He laid every brick, he did everything in the place, along with my brother and sister. I was the youngest in the in the group. My brother's 10 years older than I am, my sister's eight years older. And uh, I was about two or three while he was building this. And my job, he, he actually built the house, this is 40s now, 45, 46. Um, and uh, he built the house with radiant heat. It was a slab house. He built, the entire house was built with a single fireplace in the middle, and uh, there was a coil of copper wire that ran around through the, in a conical shape above the, the fireplace, and then that uh, copper tubing was run through the slab in the house. And so this was, I mean, he, he designed all of it, figured out how to do it. My job was to sit on the bucket while he wound the, the uh, copper tubing around the, the bucket for making it. So I got an early introduction to practical engineering, so to speak, while my dad was building that place. Um, I grew up in that area, you know, in a rural area like that, you somehow, are, you know, you're very independent. I mean, I can remember going quite often. I'd go out in the morning and I'd come back at five or six at night, and I was, you know, a little kid, and, you know, I'd probably be over at a neighbor in a cherry tree throwing cherries at each other having cherry fights or something. But I mean, we played a lot of cowboys and Indians, all kinds of stuff in the woods. Um, so I had a pretty free wheeling background. Um, my dad did uh, take the effort to, you know, had bought dry cell batteries and had some knife switches and taught me a little bit about how electrical circuits worked and so forth. Um, ultimately, I became interested in ham radio and uh, there was, this was, you know, after World War II and uh, there was a shipyard in Portland, Oregon, uh, not too far from where we lived called Zydell and uh, they had torn apart a lot of old ships and so forth. So I used to go down and, and rummage around in there. Uh, they had huge piles of electronics, uh, you know, radio equipment off of the ships. And I used to, to scrounge parts and, and put together ham radio system. Um, so that was sort of my early introduction into, you know, electrical engineering, I guess. Technology. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, from there, yeah, I went to high school in Oregon, played football. Uh, I was on the All-State team in football. Uh, actually played a little bit at Stanford, uh, just briefly. Uh, and then uh, after yeah, I went to college at Stanford um, and uh, majored in electrical engineering at Stanford. Uh, and uh, I guess after that I went, you know, applied for uh, admission to grad school, uh, ended up going to Caltech, uh, which was a, you know, the combination, quite frankly, as in my view, was fantastic, because Stanford offered you a very broad, you know, education. Caltech was really focused on, you know, whatever you were doing your PhD in with a lot of personal attention. And uh, came out of Caltech, um, it, when I left, when I was at Caltech, I made up my mind then that I really wanted to go into teaching. But one of my observations was that almost all of the really good professors that I knew at Caltech in engineering had worked at one industrial firm or another for a period of time. Um, my advisor worked at Bell Labs for a period of time, Floyd Humphrey. But, you know, a lot of them had had experiences like that. And so, you know, and I also, while I was at Caltech, uh, we had a visiting professor by the name of Horst Hoffman, who's well known in the magnetics community. Uh, and Horst and I, I was doing, uh, building a system back then in the 60s uh, where one could take 10 nanosecond photographs with a Q-switch laser of magnetic domain patterns using the magneto-optic effect in uh, thin films. Now, the, the, we were working on thin film memory, okay, which, and at those days, the main, you know, the computer memory that was used were ferrite cores, a little donut of ferrite with a couple of wires run through it, and depending on whether the ferrite was magnetized clockwise or counterclockwise, you, that was a one or a zero, you could read it out by when it switched. And that was the main memory and the storage as well for mainframe computers in those days. Um, but thin film memory had the uh, potential to uh, switch faster than uh, ferrite core. And so we worked uh, on, we were ex doing research on uh, thin film memory and I was trying to understand the mechanisms by which the thin film switched. So we built this camera that would take the pictures in 10 nanosecond exposure time, which in those days was pretty short. Um, it also required, uh, you know, a, you're having a Q-switch laser in order to do it. And in those days, you didn't go out and buy a laser. <laughs> uh, you had you, to build, build, la you build lasers. Uh, and so, you know, I, everything was hands-on. And to be honest with you, uh, when I went to Caltech, I had the, uh, I first, I spent the first summer there uh, helping to prepare one of the laboratories uh, before I'd even entered the school. Uh, and I was working for a professor by the name of Mark Nicolay, who's in the semiconductor solid state area. And uh, then Caltech's mode, the first year, you just do courses working on a master's degree. And uh, then I ended up getting into magnetics uh, after that first year, to be honest, because until then I hadn't decided what I was going to try to do. And I had the opportunity to work with, with Floyd Humphrey, though Mark Nicolay wanted me to work with him too. But the thing that attracted me to to magnetics was actually the fact that Floyd had this uh, system, okay, that he was trying to put together that had all the required very high speed pulsers, lasers, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and to me that was appealing. I liked hardware and, and tackling, you know, tough problems with stuff like that. Um, whereas, and also a little different personality between 
Mark Nicolet and, and Floyd Humphrey. Floyd Humphrey was pretty hands-off. Uh, Mark Nicolet, in my observation, was he's a great guy, uh, but he's, he was Swiss and a and little bit more of a micromanager of, of the people who were working for him. Uh, and like I said, I grew up being able to do what I wanted more or less as a kid, so I sort of, that appealed to me. Um, so I ended up, you know, getting a PhD doing these high-speed photographs of thin film switching. I stayed on, um, and while I was doing that, so I, I had taken all these photographs, had all the data of high-speed switching, and was trying to understand, develop a model for describing the switching that was going on, which was quite complex. It wasn't a coherent rotation. Uh, it was very incoherent. And uh, this Professor Floyd, uh, Professor Horst Hoffman, uh, came to Caltech <clears throat> as a visiting professor, and uh, he had a theory that he called the ripple theory. Uh, it became, you know, the old timers who worked in flat film memory <laughs> about the ripple theory. Uh, and uh, he uh, was able, working with me, we were able to explain some of the results and build a model for what we were observing. Um, and as he was leaving Caltech, um, he volunteered that if I ever wanted a position in Germany, that uh, you know I could go there and uh, have a job with him uh, in Germany, and so you know it didn't. I I stayed on at Caltech for a couple more years as a postdoc, um, but I uh, you know the the attraction of going to uh, Germany was was great because I I knew that once I got a real job that I wasn't going to be able to go live in, Ger in Europe for a period of time and, and see all the, have all the experiences that one would have. And in those days, I, w I honestly was not particularly concerned about being able to get a job in the U.S. Uh, and uh, so I took him up on his offer and uh, went to Germany uh, and did a postdoc there in, at the University of Regensburg. Uh, officially visiting scientist position, they called it. Um, the, uh, but I should say that before that, one of the things that, you know, that I was working on flat film memory and then uh, one of the, uh, I can remember in those days, I wasn't working on magnetic recording, but I do recall while I was there at Caltech going out and visiting Burroughs Corporation and at the time, Burroughs was trying to make 36-inch discs. Uh, you'd go in these huge plating baths, and, and I saw 36-inch uh, hard discs uh, being plated up, uh, which gives you an idea of the sort of, you know, changes we observed yes. uh, since those days. Um, anyway, so I went to Regensburg. Um, there... Hoffman, of course, wanted to, they, uh, the University of Regensburg was a brand new university at that time. It had been fu well funded by German, the German government, and they had a huge budget for capital equipment, because it's a new university, you gotta buy equipment and so forth. And so Horst wanted me to, to uh, you know, build a high-speed camera system for them. And so I built, I took another approach. Then commercial lasers were available and I ended up buying a commercial laser. Uh, but we used it not for flat film memory because while I was a postdoc at Caltech, and this is actually quite significant in a way in the, the history of magnetic recording research at universities, <clears throat> what happened was in 1969, which is when I got my, my degree, actually, uh, that's when I defended, uh, in 1969, I was, Floyd Humphrey and I were looking for funding for my postdoc. And we submitted a proposal to IBM uh, for funding additional work with this high-speed camera. 
and they actually responded positively and uh, sent back, you know, that, yeah, they wanted to fund it, but they wanted some changes to the proposal uh, to the intellectual property agreement. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, we worked those out from the Caltech, I mean, yeah, from the Caltech side. And uh, I, there was a conference taking place, I don't remember, I think it might have, might have been in Philadelphia or whatever, You'd ha I'd have to look back to see what, what conference it was. But it was back east and, and afterwards, might have even been Boston for all that. Um, but uh, after the conference, uh, I ended up going up to uh, Burlington, Vermont, because that's where IBM was building these flat film memory and they had actually shipped two IBM 360 computers out to Moffett Field using flat film memory. So flat film memory did end up in a, in a couple of computers. But by the time I got there, after they had said that they were willing to fund it if, if Caltech made these certain changes, I was supposed to go back and negotiate some little wording changes. But in between then, IBM made the the uh, switch and decided they were going to go with DRAM instead of flat film memory in, in future computers. And so they were busy closing down uh, the Burlington factory and converting it over to making DRAM. Uh, so we never got the funding because we never managed to, to uh, sign it in a suitable time. But the impact of that was enormous on academic universities. There were many universities, Yale, but, you know, hordes of universities that were working on thin film memory technology. Um, but when the switch was made to going with DRAM, a lot of those professors, most of them, without exception, switched over to working on semiconductor. Dick Barker at Yale totally switched into working on semiconductors. Um, Floyd Humphrey and Chuck Wiltz at, at Caltech uh, continued doing magnetics research, uh, and, and they chose to work on magnetic bubble memory, which was a new idea then that had come out of Bell Labs and, and uh, Andrew Bobeck at Bell Labs in particular, and, and uh, new memory scheme, and uh, so it, you know, Caltech was somewhat unique. I guess uh, Purdue stayed in it a little bit uh, and did some work on bubbles also. Uh, but almost the entire uh, academic world in the U.S. dropped research on magnetic. Um, and by the way, there was no one doing work on magnetic recording except at the University of Minnesota. Okay, there was a small effort at the University of Minnesota. But generally, magnetic recording was not seen as a field for doing research on, you know, at a university. It, it, it was too mature a technology. It, it didn't make sense to be doing work on that in the university. And that was the scenario in the, in the late 60s. So anyway, I went off then to the University of Regensburg. But did you, did, you never got the postdoc funding at Caltech? And I didn't get funding. We didn't get funding. So you didn't from, stay? You no, I did stay. Oh, I you stayed did. for two years at Caltech. And what did and, you do in And we got two years? funding from the NSF and some other sources. But, and, and you and continued to study on, the... We used a high-speed camera, camera for studying uh, other uh, magnetic bubble memory and things of that nature. Okay. <clears throat> um, but then I w went to the University of Regensburg, and at that time there was a lot of interest in magneto-optic recording. And so at the University of Regensburg, after building this high-speed camera, what we used it for was trying to take dynamic pictures of the magneto-optic recording process. Uh, in manganese bismuth films at that time were were one of the promising candidates for magneto-optic recording. Uh, this was before <laughs> the invention of the amorphous rare earth transition metal films, um, and, or at least in parallel with them. Uh, and so we worked on that at the University of Regensburg and 
to be honest, yeah, I worked hard at the University of Regensburg, but I also had a very good time at the University of Regensburg, and we did a lot of traveling all over Europe while we were there. Um, I had a three-month-old daughter uh, when we went there, and uh, we spent a year and a half there. Uh, and then I looked for jobs back in the, in the States. Um, I actually considered staying because we were having such a good time at, in Germany, but I decided to come back to the States and uh, look for jobs. Um, I considered myself capable of uh, But yeah, it's out there. Yeah, it'll shut off in a minute. Okay. 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 So I, we'll, uh, so yeah, pick up. Uh, you were transitioning. You were thinking what to do after Regensburg. Right. After so after Regensburg, um, I was trying to, you know, I was planning on coming back to the states, um, and uh, the I looked at various options. I mean, I threw the doors open, really. I didn't, I wasn't uh, focused on, you know, necessarily staying in magnetics even. And uh, I interviewed at North American Rockwell out in the Science Center out in uh, California, a uh, large number of places, and had job offers from a number of them uh, working in the semiconductor field. Um, because Caltech, if you went there, <laughs> you you got an education in all aspects of solid state if you were, you know, in my particular case, and magnetics was one part of it. Um, but in the end, uh, I had the opportunity to work at IBM uh, on magnetic bubble memory, and I decided to stick with magnetics, um, which I, I think was a, a good choice. Actually, one of the things that Floyd Humphrey said to me when I was, way back when I was a grad student, was in a way that one had the choice of being a, a small fish in a large pond by working in semiconductors, or you had a, the opportunity to be a big fish in a small pond by working in magnetics. And, and to me, the, the latter sounded more attractive, and that was why, to some extent, why I ended up sticking with magnetics. And for, as it turned out, I think it was the right choice. Um, I went to IBM. Uh, got there shortly after the rare earth transition metal uh, thin films had been invented by uh, Chaudhary, Como, and, and Gambino. And uh, at the time, uh, magnetic bubble, up until that time, all magnetic bubble work was being done on single crystal garnets. And uh, the idea that you could possibly make a bubble memory using a, a glass substrate and uh, rare earth transition metal sputter deposited films was pretty attractive because garnets were expensive. Um, and uh, so that was the project which I took on while I was at IBM. Uh, I, you know, again, although IBM at the time, I remember when, I, when they interviewed me, they, they uh, sort of they gave me a job offer, but the statement was, well, I could, I could come, but they didn't want me to build another camera. But within about a year and a half, they all wanted me to build a camera, and I did. I built another camera that I could use for, for, because magnetic bubbles, you could see the things and do things at high speed. So I, I did build another camera there for, for studying magnetic bubble memory. Uh, became a first level manager there. Um, and uh, in the bubble memory area, um, I was actually asked on various occasions whether I wanted to become a second level manager. And I told them no. Uh, I, and the reason was that, you know, my observation was at the first level at IBM, you can, you know, you're in the lab at least as much as you're managing, probably more. And uh, you could still stay really technical on top of what you were working on. Uh, second level, you're, yeah, you're technically involved, but, but 
you're removed from the lab. You aren't anymore working in the lab and doing stuff. And I really loved working with the hardware. Uh, and uh, so I, didn't, I had no aspiration to do that. And in the back of my mind was still this, this view that I was going to go off and work in academia. Um, I had been, you know, my, my thought in advance of joining IBM was, well, I'll spend three years there, seemed about the right time. It's enough to learn how things work in industry and then I'd go off. Well, I ended up spending five and a half. I did look around for, for you know, an academic position at that point in time. And I had various offers from various universities. Uh, I decided to go to Carnegie Mellon. Um, at the time, I thought I was half crazy to be doing this. I mean, I, it was a big move, a huge move in a way, because I, I had a very good reputation at IBM. As I said, I was a first level manager in that period of time, and they more or less offered me a second level position, but I turned it down. Um, the bubble program was right in the midst of moving a large portion of it out to San Jose, and they very much wanted me to come out to San Jose. Um, I really wasn't terribly interested in going to San Jose. I was more interested in trying to chase new t magnetic storage technologies, and I had some ideas of things to do. Uh, and Ralph Gomery was willing to say, okay, you can stay here. I'll give you a team and you can, you know, have your own group to do whatever you want uh, here. And so, I mean, I, you know, I had all the opportunities at IBM that I could possibly ask for. But somehow, I had always planned on trying to go into teaching. And I just decided, well, it's time to do it. I bit the bullet and I went to Carnegie Mellon. Um, the reason I chose Carnegie Mellon is that, interestingly enough, they had had a very strong semiconductor solid state program, uh, making some of the you know, real contributions early on. They also had a history of working in magnetics and a couple of professors who still worked in magnetics. Um, but uh, the, what had happened is that one of the professors had gone off to work at SERI, the Solar Energy Research Institute. One of them had become the head of the electrical engineering department. Another one was, was still there doing work on gallium arsenide uh, technology. But, but they'd largely lost this huge thrust on, on semiconductor solid state. And yet they had a clean room, and I put that in quotes because it was a rather rudimentary clean room, but they had a clean room, and they had uh, a fairly, then at, in those days, a Perkin Elmer 2400 uh, sputtering system, which was a, in those days, a sort of a fairly good research tool. Uh, and uh, so, and they didn't have anybody to use it. Uh, so, you know, in the end, I ended up going there. There were universities who, who, in some respects, had better reputation than Carnegie Mellon, although Carnegie Mellon even then wasn't a bad place. Uh, but, uh, and they too were after me to come. But the problem I saw was, again, if I'd go to the, the other universities, I'd have been one more professor uh, trying to make my way through the crowd. And I uh, really felt that Carnegie Mellon really wanted me to come. And so I ended up joining Carnegie Mellon. And uh, I don't know, a couple of years uh, time. Well, let's see, I joined in 78. Uh, they, I went there, I didn't care whether I had tenure or not. It didn't make any difference to me. I, uh, my attitude was, if they wanted me to stay, Fine. If they didn't want me to stay, I wasn't worried about it because I knew I could get a job. I wasn't going to burn bridges at IBM. I figured I could go back if I, if I needed to. Uh, but the bottom line is, within a year, they gave, made me a full professor and gave me tenure. Um, 
the, I developed a program almost within the first year I didn't work on magnetic recording. I've worked solely on magnetic bubble memory. By the second year, I think it was, either the second or the third year, uh, I brought in, uh, Mark Ray came in as, as one of my students. And uh, that was the beginning of working on magnetic recording. Uh, I also had quite a program on magneto-optic recording. And the thing that I found going to Carnegie Mellon was, the great thing was at IBM, I had a design group, design and testing for magnetic bubble memory, okay. But, and there was another group who would do the fabrication. Okay. Uh, at CMU, the great thing was, I had to do the fabrication, I had to do the design and testing, I had to do all of this stuff, and I could look at all of these different technologies, bubbles, uh, magneto-optic recording, magnetic recording, and sort of work in all of them and get a sense of, you know, where they stacked up against each other and, and understanding the problems and tackling the problems going after them. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, so it gave me, it allowed me to gain scope <laughs> uh, relative to what one would typically do in, in companies. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not being critical of companies, but I think what companies necessarily do is if, if you're really good in one area, you know, why would you take somebody who's really good at working on heads and put him over in media? I mean, companies sometimes do that as they try to develop people, but, but it isn't, you don't have quite as much latitude in doing that, I don't think, at a company as you do by going to a university, assuming you can get funding. <laughs> and I was very successful in getting funding. So within uh, three or four years, we had, I had built up a very sizable program uh, in, I had all the funding I could use myself. Uh, and like I said, when I went there, we had, a, there were a couple faculty, Stan Cherup and Joe Artman, who worked in the magnetics area. <clears throat> and uh, I recruited a couple more, um, Sol Sendes, uh, a finite element modeling guy, and Al Thiel uh, came along with uh, Floyd Humphrey, who joined me from Caltech. And uh, we, so we had a core group of people uh, doing work on magnetics. And so this was against the backdrop where if you went to an Intermag conference or a 3M conference, literally you could count the number of papers from academics and in on the fingers on one hand. I mean, there was almost no one from an academic institution working on magnetic recording uh, in, you know, the U.S. Yet from Japan and so forth, there were significant numbers still involved, but in the U.S. there weren't any. And so I decided it made sense for us to try to, well, I'd, another thing is I li listened to, I think it was Linville from from Stanford at a NSF meeting talking about their Center for Integrated Systems that they were putting together at Stanford. And his argument was that at Stanford it cost about a quarter million dollars uh, per year to, uh, you know, or excuse me, cost about $50,000 a year to support a grad student, okay, and if you know, and he, he took the example of the guy who invented the microprocessor at Intel, uh, and, and he pointed out that, man, eh, it took him five years to get his PhD, so he goes off to Intel, and Intel hires him, and, and you know, look what they end up with. Um, and his argument was that, you know, companies joining their center really ought to be willing to put in a quarter million dollars, because that's one PhD student per year uh, is basically what they're paying for, I mean, on an ongoing basis. And, you know, he, didn't, he, he felt that was a rationale for setting the number at that level. I heard that and I thought, well, 
you know, it makes sense and uh, decided that that was what we ought to do at, at CMU. So I, I invited about 20 of the people that I sort of considered to be the technical gurus in the, in the magnetic recording, well, in magnetics in general uh, area, uh, to Carnegie Mellon for a two-day workshop. They were from industry or from they were, they either were, academic? They were almost all from industry. Okay. Uh, names that you, you know, are well known, like Jim Lemke and Dave Thompson and uh, <laughs> you know, Neil Bertram and, and so forth. Um, and uh, they came. Uh, the focus of the meeting was to try to figure out what it was that an academic center would do uh, in the magnetics area to, that would really benefit the industry, but would not pit grad students head to head against IBM researchers trying to solve the same problem. And so you should look for problems that are, you know, industry's interested in, but they're not going to provide the resources to get it done. Maybe it's a little bit more uh, science-based than engineering-based, uh, or maybe it's just, you know, a little too far out for them to bother to do, uh, so forth. And we identified 30 topics which, you know, fit that description. And uh, that, for, based on that, that was, we held that, actually it was, we held that meeting in April of 1982. Uh, and in, I then, uh, took the time to write up a proposal based on that, and I went back <laughs> to essentially, I sent it to all the attendees that had been at the meeting, but I also went back to the, those companies requesting that they fund this center, and I put together the concept of a center. I put, we had, yeah, the top level, I, we had to have it get going, and I didn't want it you know, you don't produce wonders with a grad student in one year. So I knew that if we were going to make this successful, we had to have some sustained funding. So I put in it that in order to be join at the highest level, you had to commit to three years of funding and a quarter million dollars a year each. Now, uh, that's a little tough, that's, that's a tough requirement to some extent for some companies because to sign something like that, they basically have to sign it and they sequester those funds. They, they come off their, their bottom line that year, not, not as they pay them out. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was an obstacle, but I really felt it was important. If we were going to get this going, we had to have the resources to do it. Um, and I always tried to run the thing like a business. I mean, I, I you know, <laughs> saw it as a business and, and felt it was appropriate to run it like a business. Um, it took me about a year. I had great support from the administration at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Angel Jordan, who had been the electrical engineering department head when I joined, had been promoted to be dean. Uh, Dick Seyert was the president. And uh, Angel uh, talked to Seyert about me and my program. And actually, Seyert, not even before that, Seyert came to the workshop. And I can remember uh, Jim Lemke asking him at the end of the workshop, he said, how much you know, money do you think you need to do this? And Seyert didn't really know, have an answer, but he sort of looked at me. <laughs> And, you know, we, we quoted a, a multi-million dollar number and, and uh, so, you know, which was not unreasonable. It was an appropriate sort of number. Um, and, uh, you know, so Dick was very much on board. So through this whole year, um, my approach to going after companies was I would send this proposal to all the people that I knew well, that I thought were well-placed. Now, the people I knew well were not high-level 
you know, people, but they were very respected in the companies. They were, you know, first level, second level <laughs> managers in the technical area. They knew me, I knew them. Uh, I think we had some credibility with them. And, and then what we'd do, depending on the company, uh, I, I actually met weekly for most of that year with both Dick Syard and Anel Jordan. And we would sort of figure out the strategy on, on going after this company and that company and so forth. And the approach was that I tried to get people at the you know, mid-level management level to understand what it was we were trying to do and get their support. But I lived at IBM, I learned something there. And you know, it's, from a second level manager's position, it's not the easiest thing in the world, and a lot of people won't even attempt it, to push it up high enough to possibly cough up three quarter million dollars for a university. Um, and so on the other hand, uh, if uh, Dick Seyert writes a letter uh, to someone, or on Hill Jordan, and we did it by the company. Uh, in the case of Seagate, where the entire company is focused on data storage, Seyert wrote the letter to Al Shugart um, and requested funding. Uh, if it were an IBM, where only a division was interested in data storage, on Hell Jordan, as the dean would write to him. So it's sort of, you know, corresponding levels of people. But the interesting thing is, you know, a, a company president or vice president, if they receive a letter from a uh, president of a university or a dean, which is sort of a vice president of a university, they don't just discard it. They, they say, hey, you know, the guy's asking for all this money. I don't know if it makes sense. They, they send it down and ask the question, does this make any sense? Should we do this? And so, you know, and, and I think where we were successful was if I'd done my work, they sent their letter in. They, you know, sent the message down to ask the question and it bounces back. Now, now it isn't the guy from Ballo trying to push it up. It was the question being asked at a high level of the people at a lower level, they could respond and they could say, oh, it makes some sense from our point of view, why don't we take a look at it? And, and that worked. Um, Dick Seyert and Angel actually flew out uh, with me to numerous trips. We went to Minneapolis, we went to uh, uh, Denver uh, to meet with various companies in order to try to sell them on this. And in May of 1983, uh, both IBM and 3M committed to funding us at three quarter million dollars each. Um, oh, the other thing I should say though, is that even without the funding, uh, Carnegie Mellon built a brand new uh, 10,000 square foot clean room uh, for the uh, center. Uh, they built it actually in the old coal <laughs> fly, uh, plant uh, at in uh, Hammerschlag Hall at, at uh, so where this the was like the power uh, that's right. power generating. That's right. Uh, building. That's right. That's right. The steam plant. Steam plant. Okay. Uh, and uh, we they ripped all that out and then built a clean room down in that space. Uh, and they did that with university funds. And frankly, I can remember when 3M came around, they sent about four or five VPs of their various, you know, data storage groups and so forth uh, in, and they could see the construction going on. Uh, I think people got convinced that, yeah, we were serious about doing this. And uh, so, you know, yes, IBM and 3M kicked it off. And within a year, we had over $5 million in funding from, from uh, various, you know, a wide variety of companies. Because once IBM and 3M kicked in, uh, everything fell in place. I should, Can oh, you I remember should? who were the, some, not all, all of them, but 
beyond IBM and 3M, who are some of the early Oh yeah, well, uh, I mean, th Kodak, Seagate. Seagate didn't join at a high level at first. They joined at a, at, at a we had a menu of memberships. memberships. And actually, I, I think a lot of our success is because we had that menu. Um, uh, companies, you know, a quarter million dollars a year in 1983 was quite a bit of money for a company. Uh, and so the fact that we uh, offered a membership without getting any patent rights or things like that at $50,000 a year to companies that were smaller uh, was an attraction. Uh, so, you know, and we had different membership levels. 50K, basically you got access to what was going on, but you were gonna have to pay for patent rights. Uh, there was an intermediate, there was some intermediate levels where, I mean, they were designed to some extent for specific companies. If, if you were only interested in media, you didn't want patents on heads and so forth, well, we'd cut a deal. We'd do it for maybe 125 or something like that. Um, you know, and so there was a spectrum of, of ways that companies could get involved. And uh, the, other th the other comment is <laughs> that uh, during this time, uh, we did have, there was another center trying to be formed uh, by, I mean, Jim Lemke was, was, you know, trying to get it going and... He wanted to copy Jim, your Jim, idea. <laughs> Jim, wanted to, Jim wanted to do it. Well, I, you know, I, it may honestly have been both people doing things at the same time. I don't know. Uh, but he wanted to do it. He tried to sell it at Stanford. Stanford wasn't interested. Uh, eventually, Jim was able to get it to go to, you know, get the University of California at San Diego to commit to do it. Um, but the uh, University of California San Diego didn't have anybody who knew anything about magnetics, and so they were going to have to hire all their faculty. Um, and <laughs> another guy well known in the magnetic recording field, Al Hoagland, uh, was selected by IBM to try to figure out how to fund these various centers. Um, and Al, I think, I don't know the details of how all this was working, but Al, at one point, prior to IBM's actually funding us, uh, offered us $75,000 uh, instead of three quarter million uh, as sort of a token thing to get started. And, uh, you know, I ended up turning it down, telling them that if I, if I accepted 75,000 from IBM, we were never gonna get the, the center off the ground. Uh, and I gather that from some IBMers who I know uh, that I was called haughty for, for having done that. Um, but I think it was the right decision because in reality, how could I go to a, a Seagate or some other company if IBM weren't willing to <laughs> do the thing on, on the scale that was appropriate. And fortunately, due to uh, you, Chris, and, and Dave Thompson, they, big role in these things, uh, you know, IBM did end up funding the center, um, and uh, 3M did, and uh, we, like I said, Kodak joined, Digital Equipment Corporation joined, uh, Seagate joined, Kodak and Digital Equipment both joined at the quarter million dollar a year level, um, but there were a horde of, of small player companies who, who joined the center and supported it. A lot of them were just suppliers. I mean, substrate manufacturers, Alcoa, <laughs> okay. Uh, large numbers of companies uh, joined and supported the center. It was interesting that you were able to attract the food chain, right? The whole supply That's chain. Right. That's not right. And not just the end users of those components. That's right. Uh, I don't mean to distract you, I want no. you to keep going, but I, I, I think you may have also been familiar at that time with the change in feeling in the industry about uh, Japan's competitiveness yes. in this no, field. You might want right. to talk a little no, bit that's about good. that. That's good. 
Yeah, that was actually part of the proposal, and quite honestly, uh, it's good that you reminded me. I mean, one of the, you know, in the 80s, what was happening in the U.S. was we lost the TV business, right? There's no TVs manufactured in the U.S. We lost the DRAM business, okay? That was all being done in Japan. Uh, and hard drives were being threatened very severely uh, particularly by, at that time, what I remember is the Fujitsu Eagle Drive uh, was selling like hotcakes in the U.S. Uh, and Hitachi wasn't bad either. Uh, so they were, the Japanese were threatening to take away the industry in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, I utilized that extensively in my pitches to the company. Um, and, you know, the companies were responsive to that. They, there wasn't any question. They were, they were a little bit concerned about that. And, you know, they were, with, there were many workshops that the NSF sponsored some, uh, the DOD sponsored some, uh, at which, you know, I managed to get people from companies like IBM to come, and I can remember them pointing out that there are no academics working in, <laughs> in magnetic <laughs> recording. Right. And, and like I said, it was, uh, the view was, had been, that, oh, hard drives are a mature technology. Uh, never mind that they went, I don't know how many, probably about five or six orders of magnitude beyond <laughs> what they were at that time uh, in aerial density. but. But that was the view at that time. And so the companies responded by supporting the center. Uh, and when we formed the center, uh, University of California, San Diego also got funding at the same time. But they, had, they went out and they went out and they hired faculty uh, and became a you know, good magnetic recording center. Um, there were other universities, like the University of California at Berkeley, who had, they had been working in uh, mechanical aspects of hard drives, but not on the magnetic aspects. And they, they too, formed a center. The University of Alabama uh, decided to get into the business and put together the faculty to do so. The University of Minnesota greatly expanded their program. Uh, so there were a lot of copycat centers that, you know, then joined in. So in a way we, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's much doubt about the fact that we sort of <laughs> were the nucleus for, for starting centers throughout the U.S. in, in uh, academic institutions working on magnetic data storage in one form or another. And most of them were addressing magnetic recording problems. Um, then what began? But you had it. It seems like you had uh, because of the timing and base you started. You, you sort of had a head start, right? Oh it's yeah, like, absolutely. Like San Diego right. had to right. start with a cornfield, right? Right. They, right. they had to build a building before right. they could. Right. No, uh, we we had it. everything in place, and and we were able to move quickly. But I also think that. You know, our you come, universities have have a, in my view, a bit of a a problem running like a company, and I, I really tried to, to run to run the the Magnetics Technology Center, as it was called in the early days, uh, like a like a business. That in our business was R and D, but but to run it like a business and. All too often, I think that academic professors are, you know, willing to take that 75K, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and, and try to do something uh, instead of demanding what they ought to be getting for it. And, and so when I say I ran it like a business, I wanted to get paid an appropriate amount for what it was, what it was worth and what we were doing. But the other side is, I watched out for the sponsors' interests 
as much as I possibly could. I mean, you I would have created deliverables, willing, deliverables ex that they absolutely. would be. Absolutely. And I was uh, very responsive to the sponsors in terms of what it was they wanted to do. And I would fight for them but if there were intellectual property issues or things like that. Uh, we, but I, the other thing is that I, on the other hand, the way we were running the center, it was we wouldn't allow uh, you know, exclusive rights to contract for contracted work done within the center. Uh, if you were going to work with us, you could come in, you could fund the research, you could, we'd give you a license if you joined at the high enough level, but we were going to own it and we were going to make it available to others, but not for free. Okay, they'd pay a royalty for it if they, they hadn't deserved it which I think is a, is a good model for ways that academia can operate because it didn't then, you know, it didn't encumber us. If you take on an exclusive project and people can't talk to each other, the, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, it's, it's an appropriate space. And, you know, later on after I joined Seagate, you know, I look at that from the other side and, you know, there's, and I was CTO there at Seagate, there's no, if you have a project which you want done and you aren't willing to, I mean, you aren't satisfied with just having freedom of action, which means you have a license to the patent, uh, but you want exclusive rights for it, why on earth are you doing it through a university is my attitude. I mean, you ought to go, <laughs> you do ought to do yourself. it with your own resources right. and do it. Uh, and, and that was the way I viewed this thing. Now, the... Uh, I just want to jump in. I think his microphone's been slowly tilting to the side. I just want to make sure it's... Okay. Uh, you want to take a break, Mark? You're okay? I'm okay. Fine. Fine. No problem. I just want to make sure you're comfortable. Okay, we're still How are we doing? Initially, I think, the, as you said, the uh, center was primarily funded by the university itself and industry. Right. Later on, I think you persuaded government institutions right. to join right, yes. the center. Right. Uh, perhaps you could. Okay. Is this the right time to talk no, about that? Well, or? I'll give you another thing before that, and then okay. we'll come to that. Okay. The other thing that happened with the centers was that in... Uh, or maybe it was after that. No, you're, you're right. I think you're uh, trying to think of the timing. No, I think actually it predated that. Um, okay, let me, before I get to talking about right. the other, uh, you know, getting NSF funding, um, the other, what was happening was the companies began to get concerned that the um, centers would be duplicating each other because we'd spawned centers at all these different places. Now, my view is there was no reason for the concern because <laughs> uh, the, uh, no two professors will try to do the same thing. <laughs> professors hate doing what somebody else is doing. They, they always try to do something different original, and have their own original, own original way of trying to do something. But that was a motivation. They, they were concerned that we were going to try to duplicate what Berkeley was doing, for instance, because we were getting it, we were doing stuff. We tried to do everything across the board and tribology and all these different areas. And they were concerned about that. And uh, so they decided that they wanted to form a uh, consortium uh, called the National Storage Industry Consortium uh, in order to sort of, you know, direct these centers into different spaces. Um, it was actually an excellent mechanism, as it turned out, because uh, ENSIC um, was able to, uh, well, had regular quarterly meetings, okay, 
at which basically the academic institutions reported on their work, but uh, the companies would contribute too. And they wouldn't, you know, they weren't, the companies were naturally not giving away their secrets or their crown jewels, but, you know, you can't put an IBM guy and a Seagate guy in the same room and start talking technical issues with a third party, i.e. The, the universities, without there being sort of a three-way exchange. And, and so the universities got good guidance out of the, the companies from this. Moreover, the universities learned what the other universities were doing, and like I said, the professors didn't want to, the last thing they want to do is do the same thing somebody else is doing. So they, they, would, they would position themselves to avoid that. And this it became a very excellent vehicle for pushing the frontiers in uh, the magnetic recording in the U.S. Um, now, in that same time frame, I, mean, I, I may have it backwards as to which one came first, but I tried first in 19, I think we were trying for funding the first time from the NSF. NSF started what they called the Engineering Research Centers program. And Carnegie Mellon was successful in getting one of the first ones in the space of engineering design. So they had an engineering design research center. There were only, and these are centers that are funded uh, initially for a five-year period at something in the three to four million dollar per year range, okay, substantial funding. Um, and they're, they're funded initially for five years. They were re renewable for an additional three and then they were doable for another three. So 11 years total uh, could be funded, assuming they were making good progress. And the way it was done was that they actually reviewed after three years and made the decision whether to fund it for an additional three. So it would then, that would go, you know, af by reviewing after three, they'd extend it to, f to five, okay, uh, after, or I'm sorry, to, to eight, eight, eight after that. So, but if they weren't gonna fund it, then they'd taper down in two years. So you were, weren't gonna be, you know, you weren't, suddenly you were left and you jumped off a cliff because that, that isn't practical at a university where, you, where you've got grad students. And they you give you a warning people. light. Right, that's right, right. Yeah. that's right. But these were big, a big deal and Carnegie Mellon was one of, I think there were about eight in the, in the whole nation who already had one. Um, but I t went to the NSF and I asked them whether they thought, you know, whether it was possible to get a second one. Uh, and they said, well, you know, if you have the best proposal, <laughs> yeah, we'll fund it. Uh, and so I'm stubborn. Uh, I took a shot at it. And frankly, the first year, um, I screwed up. We, we made it, our written proposal sailed through. Uh, we got to, the, they had then have a site visit. They came to the site visit. Um, I had not, what I had done when we created the original Magnetics Technology Center, we created an advisory board but to be on the advisory board, you had to be one of the associate members, the highest paying members. The lower paying members could not be on the advisory board. So we were gonna pay, you know, that was one of the benefits that we were carving out for the highest paying members. And the, uh, they were the ones who got automatic license to patents and so forth. So, what we proposed in our proposal, technically, they loved, but we had a, a structure which was in a way untenable because what I wanted to do was to maintain the Magnetics Technology Center as this industrial run, run center. And, the, and all the engineering research centers are supposed to have, you know, good industrial funding. 
And then I wanted uh, the separate NSF center doing the NSF topics on the side. And they, they didn't, you know, and I'd sort of tie them together under one umbrella, but I'd leave every, the structure the same for the old Magnetics Technology Center. Well, that is, you know, quite honestly is not a very viable way of trying to do it. Uh, and there's a lot of intellectual property issues that you can imagine cropping up in that scenario. Um, and, you know, that came out in the site visit. They, I knew that I didn't want that question asked at the site visit, but of course it was asked. I didn't have a good answer as to how to handle it. And uh, we ended up not getting funded that year. So I learned something. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't let that deter me. Uh, you know, I went back again. I mean, one of my, actually, I can remember Angel Jordan talking about the fact that, that uh, when he, I think it was when I became a fellow of the IEEE or, or maybe when I became a member of the National Academy or something, but Angel Jordan made some comments and, and said, uh, one of the things about Mark is Mark is awfully stubborn. <laughs> and I prefer, I prefer the word persistent, but, but, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I didn't let it deter me. Uh, I went back to our sponsors and said, look, uh, UIBM and 3M and so forth and so on, you're the heavy, pay, you know, heavy hitters in this, but I can't, we, we got to open this up and make a structure where all the small companies can participate and so forth and so on. They don't have to get patent rights, but they've got to be on the advisory board. They've got, we've got to do things differently. So we restructured the proposal. And the next time I went back, I knew there wasn't a single question that they could ask me that I didn't have an answer, answer that, I, I, that I was hoping that Right, I, I, I knew it. I mean, I, actually, the day I went to, one of the things, you, you have the site visit, and I know that, that we passed. Then the final thing is you gotta go, the director goes to Washington and meets with a Blue Ribbon Committee, about 12 technical people, uh, asking you all kinds of questions about how to run the center and so forth and so on. And the day I went there to do that, you go alone, uh, and so you're interrogated, it's sort of the ultimate uh, interrogation, whatever. Uh, but the day I did that, uh, it was at a time when Congress had gotten quite upset because they learned that MIT uh, companies from Japan were able to join MIT's associates or whatever, like, I don't know the program name, but and and get access to you know, the professors would go over and, and talk to them and so forth and so on. And of course, uh, the UC Berkeley group was allowing uh, Japanese sponsors in. And at that time, we still were not. In fact, yeah, that's, a, that's a side issue, but, but in fact, one time it had come up, Alcan Aluminum, okay, which is a Canadian company, uh, was interested in joining the center and our sponsors, I brought it up to the advisory board. They, they wouldn't do it because they were afraid of the president. Um, that gives you an idea. So we were, you know, we were American. Okay, that was it. But anyway, that morning, before I even went to this Blue Ribbon panel, uh, I was asked to come up to Congress to talk to them uh, about, you know, funding of universities and so forth. And they tried to get me to say that I, I was, you know, was upset at UC Berkeley uh, for accepting foreign sponsors because they knew that we were only accepting US companies. And quite honestly, I told them what my own view was. I said, you know, every university has to figure out its own optimal plan for figuring out how it's gonna do this and figure out how they're gonna maximize their impact on, on what they're trying to do. And I didn't put down Berkeley for doing it. I said they, was it Berkeley they made or their or MIT? Was no, it, it was Berkeley. Berkeley. That was Berkeley they okay. were comparing to. MIT is the reason they were looking at it. Okay. But they, they, 
they, they knew about Berkeley and they sort of, you know, were trying to get me. They figured that I would, you know, offer some support for, you know, their position by, by comparing us to Berkeley. To Berkeley. And I, you didn't I take didn't the fall bait. into I didn't you take didn't the take bait. It. I didn't <laughs> refuse to do it. <laughs> you know, but anyway, it all went well. And it was obvious at a Blue Ribbon meeting that we were going to get funded. And, and we were. And it, Can you quantify the nature of the funding and its yeah, uh, duration? Yeah, it was, it was, we got, like I said, it was in the three to four million dollar per year range, uh, direct from the NSF. The good thing, though, was that the NSF also required uh, cost sharing of some sort from the university. And what I did, again, you, you have to think these things through, but, you know, what is hard to get at a university? Most, you can get funds for students, okay? Um, you, you know, companies are willing to give you funds for students, right? Um, you can go to the NSF. They want to fund students. Everybody wants to fund students. Um, but it's awfully hard to get funds for equipment. And so what I did in putting our proposal together was that I made all the cost sharing in the form of capital equipment so that whatever I spent from the NSF CMU had to match, and, and that gave us a real big boost in terms of our ability to have what we needed to do state-of-the-art research in an academic institution. And I think that was another good choice. <laughs> and the university went into that with enthusiasm? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They, were, they were, you know. It, I, I mean, the truth is they didn't mind what I spent it on. They were going to have to cost share a certain amount. And I wrote it into the proposal that it would be all, all spent on equipment. On equipment, and uh, so that that became the mode of operation. Very nice. The other thing that, by the way, that's another thing that occurred um, way back. If I, I'll back up a minute, when we were recruiting the initial companies, we had written into the agreement with the companies that the associate members would have a license to patent. But when Digital Equipment joined, they asked the question, well, what happens to royalties that come from these patents? Okay, they were going to join as an associate member, but, but their attorney had enough sense to ask that question. Now, this was prior to the Bayh-Dole Act which made it possible for the universities to uh, obtain patents on U.S. government-funded work. Okay. Um, and Dick Seyert, who was the president of Carnegie Mellon, he had very little interest in intellectual property. His view was he'd far rather give companies the license to the patent in exchange for an additional amount of overhead. So what he preferred to do was rather than say a 55 or 60 percent overhead rate, as sort of typical for a lot of universities, he'd, he'd want maybe 80 or 85 Five. and then give them, give them all the rights they want. All right? that, that was his model. And so when I did, wasn't even involved in this decision, Al Brannick was the uh, 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 general counsel for CMU at the time. And when Deck came back and asked the question, what, are, you know, what happens to the royalties? He simply wrote in the thing, into the agreement that the royalties would go back to the center to be used for future research. And that was the model which the center was founded on. So, that, so NSF was oh, NSF supportive was of that. that. Yeah. Yep. Very so, nice. anyway, there were yeah a number of issues like that. Then there How was a that? wasn't there also a, a Department of Commerce initiative 
that may have come later that also it's, contributed to the center, or was that? There, well, most of the Department of, yes. I'm just thinking, uh, well, yes. we're on the topic. Right. You might want to sweep in <laughs> yeah. any additional okay. government well, involvement. Well, or we funding. had a lot, I mean, we had a lot of support from, more, the things I think about more than Department of Commerce was actually, uh, well, yeah, there's a, there is a role in the Department of Commerce too. We had the center itself, even prior to the NSF funding, had pretty good support out of a lot of the DOD agencies. Uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research sponsored a lot of uh, work in the center. Uh, okay. And it's, you know, those were, you know, focused uh, research programs, but, but we got a lot of leverage out of that. The Department of Commerce piece uh, really impacted INSIC because what happened there was INSIC was looking for funds. And uh, so the Department of Con Commerce had what they call the Advanced Technology Program, or ATP program. And we wrote proposals uh, for work on magneto-optic recording, for work on GMR heads, <laughs> okay, and uh, those were, I mean, the truth is the GMR head program, which came through the Department of Commerce, were used through the NSIC organization, or NSIC, still in those days, uh, to f and the truth is, you know, IBM was the first one to put GMR heads, as you know, in, in the product, but there isn't much, I mean, I, I think that even IBM benefited from the UNSIC program on GMR. Uh, all of the, you know, and all the companies and universities were working on GMR heads in a cooperative fashion. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it was an amazingly quick time span between when GMR was first discovered and GMR heads actually became a Commercialized. That's right. So uh, the, the model was uh, Department of Commerce would assign funding managed by NSIC yes. that would flow right. to these different centers, correct. including the center that's, at CMU. That's correct. And, and the and GMR work was spearheaded out of CMU? Yes. Okay. And the same way with the Magna. Most of the programs were spearheaded out of CMU. I actually... When, when we, were look, we were looking for funding at one point in time for NSIC's programs, I walked in the door at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and I just gave them my usual pitch about what we were trying to do and so forth. And the guy looked at me and he said, he said, you know, I don't know how, you know, he said, I." I have to have a proposal to Congress within like a week or something like that. And he said, I got this money and I, you know, but I got, you know, this sounds great, but I, I got to have a proposal that I can put together. And I, I went back from Washington. I talked to the guys at NSEEK and so forth. I wrote the proposal. We got it to them and that funded NSEEK for for several years, and that was that was the ultra high density recording program, okay. um, which ultimately that was. Let's see, I have to remember whether that one that one was probably a hundred gigabit per square inch, if I recall correctly. It's uh, anyway that was you know they, and and so we 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 took various steps in NSIC. And they were typically order of magnitude steps. The first one was 10 gigabits, the next one was 100, and then we were shooting for a terabit per square inch and, and so forth. So Mark, when we took a break, uh, we were talking about the NSIC and the start of the high density recording, program. recording programs. Could you pick it up yep. uh, from there? Okay, the, the program that first got it in a big way in magnetic recording was UHDR, what we called uh, UHDR, ultra high density recording. And that 
was, if I recall correctly, I'm pretty sure that one was targeting uh, 10 gigabits per square inch. And then we, we went, um, that one proceeded, we got through that. Then we moved on to doing the EHDR, extra high density uh, recording program. Uh, and the goal there was 100 gigabits per square inch. And it was during that time, though, that Stan Cherup came out with his prediction. Uh, he and the graduate student came out with the prediction that if we kept scaling the way we were, uh, that magnetic recording would hit a hard limit at 36 gigabits per square inch. And before superparamagnetism would you know, make the recordings no longer viable. Now, at the time that came out... Can you pinpoint the time frame? The, that would have been about 85, I think, something like that. Okay. And at the time that came out, if my retro, you know, not, I don't have the numbers, no, but the dates exactly, it was around yeah. that time frame. Um, but then, and my recollection is that at the time it came out, the aerial density and products was around a gigabit per square inch. So we were, you know, a factor of 36 away, and you'd sort of say, well, that isn't a big deal, you got a long ways to go. But, but the way the industry was moving, <laughs> uh, a factor of 36 doesn't take too long. And uh, that, if you work it out in years, uh, you know, five years from now, you've got a problem. Uh, and, and that's not very long at all on the horizon of, of companies. Um, so that was a big because, concern. Yes, excuse me, I, I think you meant 1995? Because 85? Uh, maybe you're right. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. It yeah, was 1995. I think your, your density you're right. numbers are correct. My density numbers are correct. But you got a little bit early in time, yeah. yeah. 95, yeah. 96 time frame. Right. Okay. And the... Um, but yeah, the density numbers are correct. 36 gigabits per square inch, and I think the, the aerial density then was about one, one. on the product. Um, <clears throat> and in response to that, I scheduled a, a workshop. We held it in San Jose. Actually, we held it at the, Seaga the Seagate facility that I think was being closed down at the time in San Jose. And uh, we had a workshop, invited all the companies and the universities that were involved in INSIC. And in two days, I mean, two days of time, in real time there, uh, we really worked out that there were two solutions. One was to change the bid aspect ratio, uh, because at that point, 30 to 1 was pretty common for the ratio of the, the track width to the bit length. And uh, if you reduce that bit aspect ratio, then you could reduce the DMAG fields in the transition, and you could go further because those DMAG fields work against stability of the recording. And, and so that was one approach. Uh, the other approach, it was recognized at the same time that perpendicular recording could go considerably further because we could get higher head fields. You have a, an, uh, you could use a soft underlayer with perpendicular recording, which gives you essentially an image of your pole uh, of your head and effectively allows you to double the head field, which means that you can now have twice the anisotropy uh, in the material, which makes it more stable against superparamagnetism. So both of those, you know, the, the industry and, and the academics working in INSIC came out with that in real time in a two-day workshop. It sort of shows you the value, in my view, <laughs> it really shows the value of, of everybody getting together and talking about these problems and, and you know, pretty good in two days to work, come up with a major solution. We have to go back. Okay. The siren's too loud. Oh, it okay. picked us. So. Can you take us back how far back? Or? Uh, just, just a couple of, not too far. It didn't last very long. Do you remember what 
Let's see. Where you, was you, I? You, you, Sorry you, about that. Sorry, not your fault. No, you, you emerged from to... that. Uh, you were talking about the maturity of the relationship, right, between industry and academia, that you could so quickly agree. Yeah. Okay. And divide the, the right. work scope. Right? So what this? I mean, what I think that it sort of shows very clearly the value of of INSIC and in the fact that you know, and academia working with industry and in that we could have a major problem like this and then have a two-day workshop where you bring in people from industry and academia and, and in real time during that two-day workshop come out with two alternative solutions to the problem uh, that turned out to be correct. Uh, in reality for the entire industry. Um, the, you know, what industry chose to do, and you'd sort of say, of course, was to pursue the bid aspect ratio approach. And if you look back on, if you look at the bid aspect ratio as a function of time, you can plot it out and have, you know, what it was for on average drives, and you'll find that very shortly after uh, that time frame, the bid aspect ratio starts getting smaller and smaller on a steady basis. And it is true that ultimately longitudinal recording went to about 100 gigabits per square inch. Uh, and it, I would argue, it probably could have gone further. Uh, it didn't need to, though, <laughs> because uh, as it turned out, perpendicular recording. Uh, could take over in that time frame, but it, it was ready. <laughs> it was ready to be at an up. earlier time, um, and we worked. I mean, INSIC did not pursue perpendicular because the industry wanted to do 100 gigabits per square inch using longitudinal, and so the INSIC focus. The focus of INSIC's work was primarily on longitudinal recording. Hmm. Um, and they, try, they went after doing 100 gigabits per square inch with longitudinal. There were some programs within NSIC focused on, you know, trying to do some stuff with perpendicular and media and things of that nature. And of course, Jack Judy at the University of Minnesota did work on perpendicular. We did some stuff on perpendicular in, in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so there was, there were things going on in perpendicular, but not in a major way, to be quite honest. Um, and, you know, I ran the NSIC EHDR program almost essentially from the start. I probably worked in that <laughs> task for tenor through UHDR and EHDR. I don't know. That was about 10, a 10 15, year, 10, 15, 15 year period. Right, time period. Before we move off that, uh, you said early on in longitudinal recording, the bid aspect ratio was about 30 to 1. Right. Uh, I think it ended up like below 10 to 1. Yeah, right? well, yeah, it's around around 6 or 7 to 6 1. 6 or 7 to yeah. 1. So that was a major yeah. change. Yeah. yeah, yeah, tremendous change. Okay. And perpendicular recording, the reason, I mean, perpendicular recording enables you to go further to a large extent is the fact, I mean, the simple-minded Thing is that you have a soft underlayer and you can double the head field. Uh, there are other aspects of it, but but I think that's the biggest the one. It really one. really allows you to push it further. Um, but the industry, like I said, it, it was an interesting situation because the industry was busy pursuing 100 gigabit per square inch using longitudinal recording. Um, it was around that time. Uh, actually, in May of 97, uh, Seagate approached me uh, and asked me if, you know, they to come out for an interview because they were looking for a new CTO. And I went out for an interview with no intention of accepting the job. Um, I, uh, but they're a major sponsor of the center. You don't thumb your nose to the major sponsor of the center. Uh, so I went out for the interview. And quite honestly, uh, 
I, I was very upfront about it. I told them I couldn't imagine why I would go join Seagate. I had a great position at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could, I felt like if I, not that I wanted to, but if I, I could go to sleep at a Carnegie Mellon for the next five years and nobody would bother me. Uh, but, you know, I, why would I want to go work at, at Seagate as CTO? And I also pointed out to him that, although, you know, I've always worked in magnetic data storage, uh, I'd always worked in research. And it seemed to me that if you're going to be CTO for a company like Seagate, you needed to know something about transitioning product from R&D into production. And I've never done that in my life. I've always worked on research. And so I, I made it very clear I wasn't interested. Uh, and I went back to Carnegie Mellon uh, knowing that I wasn't going to get an offer. And, uh, you know, they understood that I didn't want to offer, and we were all happy. But while I was there, I made the comment to Steve Lusso that, you know, the only thing that I could imagine would attract me to, to Seagate was if they decided they wanted to start a research division uh, like IBM had in Alma Den, and uh, that maybe I'd, you know, that would be something I might want to do. Well, that was May of 97. Around January of 98, they, and then what happened is Seagate went ahead. They hired Tom Porter as CTO uh, after they talked with me. And, and then in May, and Tom had all the credentials that I said I didn't have because Tom had worked in development with IBM. He'd done a lot of transferring of technology into production and so forth and so on. They made the right choice. Um, and then what happened is that in, in January or February of, of 98, I get a call from Tom Porter. He's actually talking to Jim Williams at the time, my associate director there at, at right. uh, CMU. And uh, Jim asked him if he wanted to speak to me. I said, I explained to him I was in the room. And Tom said, yeah, let me talk to Mark. And he, he explained to me that they were inter they were, he was interested in talking to me about uh, starting a research division at CK. <laughs> and I honestly thought, oh, shit, I have to go out and no. <laughs> go do another interview. Uh, and so anyway, after a number of, you know, after they, a lot of back and forth, they're coming to Pittsburgh and my going out there and so forth and so on. Uh, and I, I became convinced that they were really serious, they were really going to do it right. And uh, so I joined Seagate as Senior Vice President of the Research. And uh, the, uh, you know, then I, and literally I started from zero. Uh, I was the first employee of Seagate Research. Uh, we didn't have a building. Uh, actually, part of the negotiation was, where are we going to do this? Yeah, and, because that's a key factor, and, right? I'm sure right. it influenced your I, decision, I wasn't, too. I wasn't willing, you know, and, well, I was and I wasn't. It was sort of interesting, because I talked with my wife, Sandy, who, of course, is a psychoanalyst and had her own private practice about the thing and, and you know, and I knew where Seagate's f facilities were. We sort of agreed we didn't want to go to Minneapolis. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we thought, well, eh, Boulder isn't so bad and, and, and that area, we like skiing and, and so forth. And, and you know, the, the uh, Scotts Valley area isn't a bad area and so forth. So we thought, well, that's doable. But in the end, I actually made, and she was willing to give up her practice. But in the end, I sort of came to the conclusion, I didn't want to leave CMU in the lurch. And I sort of felt like, I, I mean, I had always been the guy going out, getting funding, doing everything at CMU in terms of driving it forward. I wasn't worried about the fact that there wasn't a competent faculty there, that I knew there were 
very good faculty who could do all the research and so forth. But any organization like that needs a leader, and I didn't know what had happened once I walk out the door in terms of things happening. And I figured that if I stayed in Pittsburgh, it isn't that, you know, I could <laughs> be senior vice president at Seagate and, and influence things in, in CMU in a big way. But on the other hand, if CMU wanted to call and ask me, <laughs> what do you do about this or that or whatever, I could be available to do it and, and do things like that. So I, I sort of decided that less from a personal point of view, but more from the point of view that I wanted to, having built an institution like the Data Storage System Center at Carnegie Mellon, I didn't want to see it blow up. And uh, I decided that was going to force the thing to be in Pittsburgh or I wasn't going to do it. But what happened was when Tom Porter finally uh, came to me uh, with the offer, uh, he had talked with Ed Scalco and some of the other people at, at Seagate, and they had already convinced him that, they, that it, it made sense to do it in Pittsburgh. And so reality is that Tom offered me the job and told me at the same time that we could do it in Pittsburgh. And uh, so when I started, we had no building. We had, you know, it was literally starting from zero. Uh, there was that one guy who uh, uh, they assigned to help me get it started, uh, and he had actually just shut down another lab <laughs> uh, at Seagate. And uh, he came over from, at the time he'd been living in Arizona, uh, he came in and, uh, you know, he, he was sort of the person who knew how Seagate operated. Uh, if you're going to start up a, a division right, like right, that, right. you got to you got to know how to order things. You got to know how to how to get the IT people going. You got to yeah, know yeah. how to do all this stuff. He knew the infrastructure and was able to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, so he was invaluable to me. Um, the but literally we then had to hire. Well, we contracted an HR firm in. New York City, <laughs> and they assigned somebody to me to, you know, be my HR person for a while uh, until we could get somebody, and, and we just started hiring. Uh, early on, we got an HR person. Then I got, uh, you know, started hiring, uh, you know, the what I was trying to do. My my approach, quite honestly, from the beginning was I wanted to hire an experienced research management team, but my view was the best people to do the actual research were new grads, all right, new PhDs. Um, and the reason for that is that my observation was if, if you give you know, if you ask the average recording engineer how to do a factor of 25 to 100 higher density than, than what you're doing today, he'll give you five reasons why it can't be done. Uh, and the nice thing about a new grad student is he's sort of at the peak of his, his naive uh, and view of and how, enthusiasm. how right, and enthusiasm. <laughs> he can do anything. And uh, you bring them in and, you know, they just do it. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was have an experience, and there are, and everybody isn't that way in research, but, but and, and that's what I was hoping to hire were key guys. As managers. From, as managers who had been in research a, quite a while and knew how it worked, but populate the place with new PhDs. And that's basically what we did. We, uh, I was also curious, uh, were there any people within Seagate at that time that you could draft into there, the research division? There were there a were, uh, few that we tried to get, but very few that, that we actually got over. Okay. Okay. There, were, there were, you know, almost none. So basically we hired everybody from the outside. Okay. And most of them were new grads. Some of them had been postdocs at 
NIST or something like that, things of that nature. But that was how we actually, you know, got, got the, the whole thing going. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, to be honest with you, of course, my experience in research was at IBM uh, in companies. And what I tried to do was adopt what I considered the best practices at IBM Research and to do it, get, get rid of the things that, <laughs> that I think didn't work at IBM Research. Um, and it seemed to end up being a pretty good mix. Um, what we started doing from day one was we decided we were going to target 100 gigabits per square inch, but we were going to do it with perpendicular recording okay, in research. Um, and I led a program, though, corporate-wide on 100 gigabits per square inch. And the, so research was doing perpendicular. The development divisions were doing longitudinal. And so we were, you know, sort of competing, but not really. I mean, it's just, you know, two approaches to trying to solve the same problem. So from day one, 1990, August of 98, we started working on perpendicular recording um, at Seagate. And uh, by 2001, we had uh, demonstrated nearly, we didn't get to 100, uh, we got to 90 <laughs> gigabits per square inch using perpendicular recording. Prior to that, maybe a year prior to that, uh, some of the guys in the development, some of the advanced development guys in the development division working for Nigel McLeod at the time, um, wanted to work on perpendicular recording. And I, you know, we had all this modeling. We knew that perpendicular would go, how far it would go, and we knew how far longitudinal would go, okay? We were quite confident of our numbers. We had good models. We knew what, what they could be done, you know, what we could do with each one. And, but the guys in, in the advanced development group wanted to work on perpendicular. I called Nigel up and I told him, listen, if your guys are gonna start working on perpendicular, let me know because I will shift my whole effort to longitudinal because it's got more legs to go yet before we, it's time to switch it over. And he shut them down, which was the right thing to do at the time. Right, from because a corporate, it was, corporate viewpoint. That's right. right. <laughs> and, and we continued working and got to the 90 gigabits per square inch. And once we hit 90 gigabits per square inch at the spin stand level, uh, we didn't do our 100, but I mean, that just would have taken more time. We'd have right. gotten there. It's just, you know, you don't quite have the head you need in the media and so forth. Uh, the, it would have taken another generation of heads, basically, and that wasn't fast. Uh, so we decided, okay, and I called up Nigel again, and I said, Nigel, now's time for you guys to get into this. And uh, we produced 500 pages of documents on, on how it all came together and, you know, worked diligently for the next, you know, six months to a year, transferring the technology uh, into the development division. And the, you know, one of the things I will say, having, having gone through this process, um, the guys in the development division subsequently, I mean, at first they were you know, glad to have our help. But probably a year after we had had uh, gotten out of perpendicular recording, if you'd have talked to them, they said, oh, we did it all. It's not, you know, r research had nothing to do with it. I'm not, I'm not being critical because I actually anything. think that that's a natural thing. And they did do a lot. I mean, they, they're the ones who got a lot of the bugs out and made things work. But there's a huge amount of work that has to be done beyond the spin stand, first spin stand demo. And in fact, I learned in that process that you know you've done your job in research, when, which includes tech transfer, when the people you're transferring it to now say, 
Research didn't do anything. Yeah, well, and they, you they, now they know. I, now I know I've done my job, right. and 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 you're free to go on and do other things. Right. Um, and and that's the way we treated it. In early 2001, we had to figure out what we were going to do next because I wasn't going to be <laughs> having, you know, I they, if I I took the viewpoint from the beginning that if all we did was add, you know. 150 to 200 manpower people to Seagate, who has 5,000 engineers anyway. I mean, they may as well work for yeah. in, in the development division. So there's no sense in doing that. And that was why I let Nigel know, keep your guys out of this until That's we're ready to ready. transfer yeah. it. Right, doesn't make sense. And the, uh, so, you know, once we had really begun transferring it, we had to figure out what we were going to do next and they had to do something different. So, you know, this was a time of Seagate was into the mode of trying to apply Six Sigma to, uh, you know, what, everything they were doing. And so we, we uh, you know, used Six Sigma approaches to trying to select our next set of projects. and and. Uh, you know, we evaluated uh, heat-assisted magnetic recording. We evaluated probe recording. Uh, we evaluated uh, uh, pattern media recording uh, and some others, okay. And we did this as a group, the entire group. We had a huge, you know, a meeting of all hands, basically everybody sitting around talking about the things. Then we subdivided and different groups went off to address different technologies. And then we, we weighted things like, you know, you, you look at all the different application spaces, you know, mobile, PCs, enterprise, okay? And what are they, what are they good for? And then we weighted, weighted characteristics like access time, what do we believe we could get to, which would have the best density, what would have data rate, what, you know, shock resistance, I mean, all the parameters that you think of in doing magnetic recording. And we um, went through and did an analysis and figured out that, well, it wasn't, you know, 100% clear, but we picked out hammer, probe recording, and pattern media recording. And we went after those then in parallel with each other, uh, with you know, subsets of the team uh, working on them. And uh, along the way, um, a guy, Bob Thibodeau from Carnegie Mellon, uh, started talking to me about the fact that, and Bob was out of the computer science department, um, that, you know, he felt that we really needed also to uh, take a look at um, uh, full disk encryption. Uh, and so we started a program also on full disk encryption. We actually hired Bob. He had a patent on it uh, and we hired him and, and came to agreement with him on a, a reimbursement scheme for his patent and uh, we started the program on full disk encryption at that time. Um, the, you know, subsequently then you have to ask yourself, when did, you know, how did we manage to bring perpendicular to product within Seagate? Well, what, what happened is development took over in, in 2001, okay, and it wasn't until Roughly 2005, we began sampling drives, okay? Uh, 2006 was really high volume production. And we moved to perpendicular across the whole product line as fast as, as we could manage to change products. I mean, it was just, you know, any new product was going in in perpendicular after, after 2006. Um, we did not choose to, you know, I'd, I'd been, where did I hear? There, yeah, it was, well, I think I was still at IBM or maybe I heard about it for, at some of the 
advisory board meetings about when IBM was introducing new new technologies. They they tried to quite often introduce them in, you know, sort of products where it they weren't the really risk, the business. That's yeah. right. It wasn't critical to the business and so forth. Seagate didn't do that. They basically we looked at it and we said, you know, way, the way Seagate operates on product development is that they have these core teams, and you know, <laughs> they'll put together a core team for a particular product, and then they just de develop it and so forth. <clears throat> and it just happened to be that there was a core team available, their product had been delivered, and they, so they chose some of those people, put them together, and this was the next one up, and it happened to be an enterprise drive. Um, and that's, you know, Seagate's bread and butter, and so it was a different approach, yep. but, but that was what they were trying to do. And uh, when, w what we would do at Seagate was have for a while, we were having quarterly technical reviews, and then they became semi-annual. Um, but at those meetings, you know, we'd have reports on all the different, you know, technologies, the heads and the media and so forth. But the way the decision was made to make the crossover was we did have teams working on, you know, perpendicular media, trying to improve signal-noise ratio. We had teams working on longitudinal, making signal, you know, measuring signal to noise ratio. And we literally, I mean, these were, you know, full scale teams trying to get things done. We were plotting the uh, signal to noise ratio in dB as a function of time. For each of those approaches. For both of those approaches. And you could, you could look at it and you could see longitudinal was coming up with this slope, perpendicular was coming up with this slope, and you could look at it and say, well, gee, they're in a cross here. Oh, well, that's where we go with perpendicular. And that's what we did. That was the way we made the choice. And, uh, you know, and that's why I say longitudinal could have gone further. There's no question. But it was going to take longer than if we switched over to perpendicular. Right. Uh, because perpendicular was there and ready to go. Um, I, you know... I think it may be worth clarifying uh, the importance, what signal to noise ratio means, right? It's not oh, yeah. bread and butter no. of a recording system, right? I yes. Mean, it, it determines the <laughs> reliability of the data, right? Yes, absolutely. So no, you I, might want to expand a little bit about that. Well, signal to noise ratio is sort of everything in the drive. I mean, if you have the signal to noise ratio, your servo works, the signal processing works, the data rate, it can be cranked up, so forth, so on. And if you don't meet the requirements, then you know you aren't going to make it. So, it 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 is the key criterion uh, that one is usually struggling to get, and and it's a function of heads and of media, okay, both <laughs> in terms of what you're looking at, but. But that's fundamental to being able to, to take your density to a higher level. And it probably is a key competitive edge, the company that can deliver oh, yes. the best signal to noise ratio. Right. If it does everything else right, delivers the best product. Absolutely. Right. You either, it's best either in, you can go to, a, you can spend it either way you want to. You can take higher, higher density, right. okay, which obviously gets you a, a bonus. But you can also spend it on reliability, and and either one gets you a competitive edge. Absolutely, right. no question about it. So you know that. So and so you pre must have predicted that that crossover would have occurred at around 2005, 2006. That's right. That's exactly that's right. That's what drove. That's the right. Lead. You then followed that's through. Right. Yeah. The products showed up in volume in yep, 2006. 2006, and it it was. It was the smoothest transition. I mean, I, it, <laughs> there was not actually, you know, I think you had suggested I might try to address what the, you know, one of the key issues was in trying to bring perpendicular t together. Reality, I mean, yeah, I guess I could say signal to noise ratio, but, but the, the reality is that if I'm thinking about the, the perpendicular program, it wasn't one thing. It was, you know, it was getting everything running, uh, and it was the integration. It was the teamwork. It was 
people working together to do the whole thing. And it turned out to be an amazingly easy transition. I mean, I, I, I'll have to say that, that compared to you know, a lot of technological changes, that one went very, very smoothly. Now, and I, and I think I think if in the context of the industry, right, your, the Seagate team was the one that was either first or close oh, yeah. to the first. Yes, no, in, in the volume production, product. Seagate was the first. There's no question right. about it. Toshiba brought out a, a perpendicular drive and put it in a product, if not very good product, a Walkman style, <laughs> you know, music recorder. Uh, I don't mean to put them down, but that was what it was used in. Seagate brought out, as soon as they brought out their high volume uh, drives, like I said, they, we just started putting it clear across the product line and by, you know. Yeah, I think, I think it, you had characterized Toshiba chose the conventional approach of, may have chosen of not betting the whole business. Right. Trying it in a right. low risk product. Yes. I think you guys chose at Seagate, right. chose to bet the business on it. Right. Uh, that was yeah. gutsy. Yeah. No, and it, it paid off well. And it, it, the product showed that to us because we'd, we'd had drives for a long time and we were sampling them and we, yep. we were, I mean, <laughs> it was working. There wasn't any question about it. The, uh, the latter, uh, a lot of this was now being done by development. Uh, you stayed connected with it through these product oh, yeah. reviews? So well, yes, that's correct. Reviews. Well, all the technical reviews I was part of and, <laughs> and yeah. so forth. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, so now you, you mentioned you had this three-horse race, Hammer, right. uh, Probe Recording, and, and Pattern Media Recording. Right. Uh, right. Uh, how did that sort itself out? It, or did it? Is it no, still going it's on? Sort of, it, it, no, it's not. Well, I don't consider it still going on, but, but uh, it's it sorted it out itself out very well. Um, and what happened was that we worked on those three. Now, you got to realize that we started this in 2001, okay? And we mentioned earlier the ATP program from the Department of Commerce, and that still existed. Uh, in that time frame. So we went to the Department of Commerce, we research, and uh, sold them a proposal on supporting Hammer. Okay. Uh, they did not by any means pay all the bill. They, right. paid, they right. pay a cost sharing uh, toward making a research program on Hammer. Um, but and I saw this work that way at, at IBM too. Uh, you, you know, yes, it was cost sharing. So Seagate was matching what the Department of Commerce put in. But in reality, Seagate put in a lot more than the Department of Commerce. But also, it really gave us. <laughs> Let's take a break. Yeah. Does uh, Sandy still out? I think she is. So they, this will rig for a while. Go to the machine answers. Answer. Right? Middle. I bet you have it programmed for five rings. <laughs> okay. okay. So, so we were at the uh, ATP. Yeah and the commerce, the, yeah. their contribution. So anyway, we, Seagate went to the Department of Commerce uh, and we, whoever it is, is trying a second time. Can we turn off the ringer? Probably uh, can, uh, Just wait. Sorry. Otherwise we have to de-mic. Another thirty seconds. I think they give up. <laughs> okay, 
So in that time frame, the Department of Commerce still had their ATP program, uh, Advanced Technology Program, and would fund uh, industrial projects that you know, were high risk. And, and uh, so we in Seagate Research decided to go after one of these and got funding for it to support hammer or heat-assisted magnetic recording. Um, the, uh, they provided, they would match funds that Seagate put in up to a certain limit. And we involved uh, the universities in that, Carnegie Mellon, University of Minnesota, uh, University of Arizona was part of it, um, various universities as well as ourselves doing this, this uh, advanced program. And as I saw at IBM, which IBM did on occasion, would get outside funding like this, and they would usually leverage it into a larger program, and, and we were able to do that at Seagate too. I don't, you know, to be honest with you, had uh, we not had the ATP funding, I could have had a hammer program, but it wouldn't have been as successful as it, you know, as it was. It wouldn't have ever scaled up the way it did. Uh, because of the government funding, we were able to pursue it very aggressively. Um, and uh, in about, I don't remember the dates exactly, but it probably took, say, two years into the program, so maybe 2003, 2004 time frame. Um, we, I looked at it and, um, oh, actually, that's right, there was, there was a uh, thing which triggered the review, and that is that there was a, uh, this was a time when Seagate was getting pinched in their margins. And the reason was, and it, this would have been at, at uh, I think it was when we were at 60 gigabyte drives, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in that range of time frame. Um, and what had happened is that it, prior to that, if you brought out a new drive, um, had higher density, of course, than the previous generation, the uh, OEMs were always willing to engineer it into their new product. But at this particular time, uh, Michael Dell and others in the industry were only willing to move it in if it was actually a lower cost than the previous drive. Hmm. And, you know, Seagate had you know, they'd hired me because they realized that they needed to be a technology leader. Their model had been to be a low-cost producer. They, with the aerial density going up so fast, when they were late by three months, they figured they lost a billion dollars in, in sales and that they couldn't be late anymore. And so that was why they hired me to be senior vice president of research, was that they wanted a research division so that they could be a technology leader and, you know, Tom Porter, in order to um, create research, uh, had closed down all of their work on mobile drives because he just closed down the entire factories because without having the aerial density leadership, there wasn't any use in being in mobile. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, they hired me specifically to be able to do that. And we did get the aerial density lead. Uh, and got back in the mobile space and so forth. So the, um, I lost my train of thought. Well, uh, yeah, I Before think that. your Seagate was at a pinched point. Ah, yes, P Seagate was a, and, and what had happened was we always, you know, we, we were making, we had to make money on the front end now that we we're doing research, okay. Yeah, yeah, but I think you and need I'm, to come back and okay, clarify that. Okay. Why was that pinch? You're, I think you're making okay, the, the point pinch that point, the customers- The customers suddenly changed said- Changed their modus operandi. Exactly, that's right. The customers suddenly were not willing to pay for the highest 
you know, the new high density product, it had to be a lower cost product than the, the previous one. And the net result was instead of having a six month product cycle, the thing lasted for a year or so. And that really killed Seagate because they were suddenly, <laughs> you know, they, they made money off the front end by having a yeah, they, higher price and paying for things. Now they were competing with, on a, you know, long time scale and, and it let everyone else, gave everyone else a, a, a chance to have a breather. So what happened is Seagate was pinched and we got, went into a mode of, of internal, you know, product review in a major way. Uh, and took some cutbacks. Always before I'd been protect, protected from these cutbacks and was actually allowed to continue hiring. This time it was across the board. And so, you know, we just all agreed we'd take a five, I don't remember, it was 5%, I think it was a 5% cut in, in headcount. And so my attitude was, if I'm going to be asked to cut 5%, I'm not going to cut 5% out of the thing across the program. I'm, my attitude is I'll, I'll take rifle shots. I won't use a shotgun, but I'm going to figure out which programs, which programs to, kill. to kill. And at that time, I killed Bit Pattern Media at Seagate. Um, and uh, it was, I think, the right decision. Yeah, with better uh, hindsight. <laughs> Uh, and, and the reason is I could not fathom how one could make that a low-cost technology. I mean, it, it, to me, it was not going to do it. Uh, Dieter Weller was there at the time, and Dieter Weller agreed with me. Okay. Um, now, subsequently, Dieter went out and worked in, in uh, he, he left, actually his wife wanted to go back to Germany, and I talked him into going back out to San Jose, uh, and which his wife was willing to do, and he went to work in the the uh, media division out there, and they then initiated the program on not pattern media. On pattern media, uh, though Dieter agreed with me that that it should be killed at research and the before that, but uh, that's more of a political thing within Seagate at the time, by another uh, the head of the media division. Um, and, and so, uh, but we in research continued pursuing Hammer and we continued working on Probe. Uh, we thought, I mean, well, yeah, I think the CEO was honestly quite interested in Probe technology. He was, he was really interested in trying to, the CEO at that time was Bill Watkins, uh, was quite interested in trying to make something more akin to a solid state type drive technology. Um, I honestly did not sell probe hard because I saw it as further out than hammer. Uh, but I, you know, I mean, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta evaluate it, see whether it makes sense or not. And we had a different approach. We were to doing it than what IBM had done with their millipede project. And uh, we'd gone over and talked to IBM too about theirs and, and uh, you know, had a good exchange and so forth. Um, but we, so we kept those two programs going but for quite a while. But by the time I left, uh, we had killed the probe program uh, and Hammer was up at uh, you know, closing in on a terabit per square inch. Uh, and, on spin stand density demos. Um, so the, the uh, hammer today is still not in product. Um, of course, what happened at Seagate, by the way, was that we got through that crunch time with the, the cut, but, and then I retired from Seagate in 2007 uh, early 2007. Uh, 2008 occurred <laughs> with the recession, recession. and uh, Seagate closed down Seagate Research in 2009, which I 
think was a real shame, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, Steve Lusso, you know, had Bill Watkins been let go six months sooner, he wouldn't have closed it down. But but it was already closing by the time Lusso took over again. They definitely. Um, they and that's right. And the reason I think it was such a shame is that. We had, the only reason Hammer got off the ground is because the fact that we had heads, we had media, we have the optical, the near field optical guys, we had signal processing, we had servos, we had it all in a team of a hundred or so people and different groups addressing all those issues. You could tackle a technology like that in that sort of mode, somewhat uniquely. Uh, because in a hammer drive, the head is, I mean, the media is part of the head. I mean, it, it really is, because it's got to have optical coatings on it, it's got to have thermal stuff to, to handle those no things. Single, I mean, it's not. There's no silver bullet. You can't, you no. have to. Yeah. De yeah. deliver all of those building blocks. Exactly, and you can't treat them independently. I mean, you can't go off and work on one part of it in one place and another part somewhere else and expect them to work together. You want the inventions to happen, you gotta have people banging their heads together on a, on a daily basis. And I think, you know, it probably costs Seagate a couple of years. <laughs> In, in bringing out Hammer. So, you know, I don't know when Hammer will be out for sure. But it I seems am told to be that I am told that I mean, what Seagate on, is, right? oh yes, it's being worked on. Moreover, I'm told that Seagate is sampling a few drives and the claim is that uh, they'll probably have it in product by 2018. To me, that's credible, mainly because I know something about how Seagate operates, and Seagate has a three-year product plan, and that product planning, that three-year planning process, basically when a product is put into that, it, you know, 90-some percent of those come out the other end on time. Uh, and, you know, doesn't say all of them do, but most of them do. So, you know, if they, when they're saying it's three years away, I, I say, oh, they don't know when this thing is coming out. Uh, but when they say it's a year away, I suddenly begin to think, uh, yeah, like they beginning to be, it. yeah, they may actually make it happen. So, you know, that's the situation. And full disk encryption, of course, that actually went into product while I was still there in 2007. And, you know, they and continued how did it. And how did it evolve from uh, Pittsburgh, the research center? They, the they worked, we worked very closely with the drive development divisions, and uh, Bob Thibodeau was key at making, you know, making the whole thing happen, but they have now, that's all been <laughs> taken over by the drive guys. And, you know, that was a very successful program also for the company, there's no doubt about it. I'm not very familiar with the, uh, the, the, that method of encrypting, but is it now used in, uh, across all drives? It's used, by it, it, you can get it in all drives, but yes. you don't so have to So it's an option. It. It's an option. And it's used very extensively. The NSA insists that, that you know, you're going to work drives on it. Use. They, that's right. They, okay. The government uses a lot of the full disk encrypted drives. Uh, it basically protects the data at rest. And, you know, it also, you know, <clears throat> it's good in cloud systems because you can have a single drive with data from multiple customers on it. And you can ensure that. <laughs> Customer A is not going to be able to see customer B's data because he's not just doesn't have the password to to, to, to access, to access it. Very it's just public private keys and and the data is protected. And you know, you can it you know, they they it's set up so that 
I mean, in reality, I mean, if you forget the password, you can set it up so that there's two, and so that's what you know. It's designed so that there you can give the IT guy, <laughs> okay, your IT person a password for it, uh, so he can break it if the individual who forgets owns the his data code. forgets it or somehow, right. yeah. But but uh, that's the mode, and that was a very, another successful product. That and came the out. time frame uh, in which it was actually commercialized. Uh, I would Roughly. say around 2000, around 2006, seven, eight, yeah. that time frame. Started coming into, first it was introduced in mobile drives, but now it's being used in a lot in enterprise drives and so forth too. Well, congratulations on that uh, series of transfers, right? And which are all also, in a way, rooted in the CMU. No, they are, very they, uh, definitely. The Hammer program uh, is without question came out of CMU. I mean, that's, again, it, in a way, it's rooted clear back to Caltech because the high-speed laser yeah. and then doing small spot. I, did, I wrote a paper with Eric Betzig, and Eric Betzig is a recent Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, interestingly enough, uh, for his work on near field uh, optical microscope. And I wrote a paper with him in about, I don't know, it would have been 80s somewhere, uh, in which we did uh, near field op magneto optical recording uh, at an extremely high density at the time. I don't remember what it was, but it was, you know, an incredibly high density. Uh, Reality is it wasn't commercializable because we couldn't possibly, do that. the head was so inefficient that, yes. that you couldn't get enough power down it to, to do what you need to do. But that knowledge, okay, the fact that there was, you could make a near field uh, fiber <laughs> that would produce a, a uh, you know, 10 or so nanometer size spot. Uh, is, you know, a big reason why we had the hammer program. Because yeah, once, once I recognized, I gave, yeah. I suddenly said, well, wait a minute, and we got to find a more efficient transducer and, and hired some smart guys who knew something about doing that and, and uh, that gave life to the hammer program. So hammer evolved out of, really out of CMU. Perpendicular certainly came out of CMU to a large extent, and and the NSIG program. Uh, well, the, I would and, I would say look and maybe, full disk really, encryption. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really look at it, right, uh, the prerequisite was to have that uh, center, a joint yep. industry, yep. academia, Absolutely. government center, right? Because Absolutely. that laid the foundation. Yep. Without that foundation, none of this. None no. of these other events could have uh, followed. The other thing is that in the CMU contribution, which shouldn't be overlooked, is just the, the, you know, the number of students who pass through the place. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, you. It's, can you, you know, we were we were someone? running we were running uh, when I was there. We had about a hundred grad students, typically. So you can just do the math, and you can figure out that that. Five-year lifetime, or graduating, you know, twenty grad students a year, PhDs, um, and most of them went to work in the industry. Um, and today's leaders in the industry, a large percentage of them came out of CMU. Okay. I mean, no, yeah, I would, yeah, I would characterize that a little bit more in the sense that prior to the existence of these academic centers. The industry hired engineers, yes, yeah. but and they then came in them. knowing nothing right. about magnetic right. recording, right. and then they would have to right. train them, right, and that added right to their ability to contribute, right, d delayed, yep. Whereas by training them yep. in these centers, they could they start land contributing on, they land much on earlier. Feet. Yep, landed on their feet running, uh, and, and they also, I mean, if they came through CMU. The thing about, and this was the advantage of the NSF funding, by the way. The NSF really wanted a systems approach. 
Um, and under the Magnetics Technology Center, prior to the NSF, at that transition, we renamed Center, it became the Data Storage System Center. But prior to that, it was the Magnetics Technology Center. And under the Magnetics Technology Center, basically the companies sort of told us what they wanted us to be doing. And the truth is, the companies weren't as wise about that as they could have been, because they, they all have their hot buttons, and they, they try to direct you toward whatever they happen to see as their pet project. Now, I was sort of stubborn and did some, you know, took some of the money and said, oh, well, hell with it, I'm going to do this anyway. And, you know, I can remember, I mean, one project that came out of that was what Mark Ray did, which was build that high-speed scanning Curefect microscope, which Kodak, IBM copied, and then uh, uh, Phase Metrics turned into a product and sold to most companies in the industry. That product, that probably wouldn't have happened had I listened solely to industry. But, and so I knew that I had to try to do some of these things on my own. But the thing that the NSF money allowed us to do was not just be a magnetics center, but rather they really wanted us to take a system approach. And it is that system approach, okay, having signal processing, having servos and tribology, doing the whole thing, okay, not packaging, but everything's right. up to spin stand level and, and a little beyond. Uh, taking that systems approach, that's what caught, that's without that, we would never have had the Jose Mora Ali Kavchik patent, okay. I'm the one who got Jose involved in, in, you know, the center and tackling these problems. And he learned a lot from the industry. Uh, he had prior students prior to Alec Kavchik. Uh, he was trying to do multiple uh, read heads so that you could, you know, do, uh, get rid of the inner track interference by, by doing parallel, you know, re uh, parallel reading. reading and things of that nature. Uh, but, you know, the course of doing all those projects, he gets smarter and smarter and figures out what can really work. And the net result was the algorithm that, you know, Marvell eventually utilized in their product. Uh, it obviously it. had a big impact on the industry. <laughs> and so, the NSF, you know, funding enabled us to do that. And that's the other characteristic I think that most people talk about, about the CMU grads, is that they came out, you know, you might have hired somebody to work on media, but he understood why signal noise was important and what it was and so forth. And if he hired somebody to work on signal processing, he had an idea of what it was in the media that was causing the problem. It wasn't just a, a noise background that right. he was dealing with. He could, he could interact and talk with the media people or the head people or whatever and to be able to actually understand what was going on. And I think that, that was a key contribution that came out of it. There were other patents, right, that uh I remember there were some media patents yep, yep. that became Dave valuable Lambeth, in the industry. Dave Lambeth and Dave Lachlan uh, developed the nickel aluminum underlayer for for uh, glass and substrates. That enabled some of the early that, mobile drives. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, but coming back to the Mora Kafchik uh, invention, uh, I think in the end CMU was able to get what may may have been the highest royalty revenue case involving academia, right? Uh, Could be. I don't know. It may be. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Can you <laughs> share with us what was the... Well, I think that, uh, I think that it was something payment? like, so it was, I don't know the exact numbers, but it, the total amount was about $750 million in the, the That's what I remember. And 250 of that, I think, went to the attorneys. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mora and Kavchik uh, got half of the remainder and uh, the rest of it went to the university. 
Yeah, I had read that uh, there were larger royalty cases in in, the, in industry, particularly among pharmaceutical companies. Oh yeah, but that this was the highest ever hmm. involving an hmm. ac I a patent I didn't from know academia. That, but I wouldn't that's be surprised. That's what, uh, what I heard. Uh, yeah. And, uh, well, it's a big number, that's for sure. And, uh, <laughs> well, it's. <laughs> You, you should be proud of the fact that that's one other measure yeah. of the value yeah. of what that uh, uh, the center yeah. uh, created uh, over time. The, uh, well, let me as you as you now integrate what you just covered for us. Uh, uh, can you give us some examples of what were some of the most difficult challenges you had to sure. uh, overcome in, in, in across the whole gamut of your assignments? You know, okay, well, listen, I, I actually, I mean, to be honest with you, Chris, I, you're not gonna get the answer I think you expect. The, what I'm gonna tell you is, although you, I know you know this, that is, that the technical problems were all rather straightforward. And I mean, yeah, they're challenges. Okay, no question about it. The technical problems, I mean, you know, how do you build a near field head? I mean, what, like I said, <laughs> you need something drastically more efficient than what we had, uh, and so forth. I mean, those are tough technical issues. But you know, that isn't, those aren't, I mean, you get clever people, you put them to work on it, and you keep prodding things and asking questions and, and assemble a team of people to make things happen. The hard, hard part in these things are the, the challenges of, of the personnel issues, getting things running right. And I always, I mean, my, my argument is that I think the place where I've been able probably to make more of a contribution, and I have, I don't know, 400 papers and, you know, 25 or 30 patents or something like that. So I mean, I've made my share of the technical contributions. But, but that isn't the issue. The, the key thing, I think, is being able to get, uh, facilitate the team really working together and addressing these issues. And I think that's where industry quite often falls down. I actually think that, that that's a distinguishing feature of companies who can run a, a research and development operation and ones where, you know, I mean, companies, you know, we all know that there's a lot less R&D done today, or a lot less R done today, for sure, in industry than there was 30 years ago when, you know, or 40 years ago when you and I were, were at IBM together. Uh, the, so, and I think the part of the reason is they really don't know how to run those programs. And getting, you know, how do you, how do you, encourage people to work together to solve these problems. And I, I can remember so many times talking to all our, all the people at Seagate Research about the fact that, you know, when we would have some of these cutbacks, okay, at the, at the company, I'd, I'd have an all hands meeting and I'd, I'd explain to them that whether it's going to affect somebody here or not, I, they would be of course, talking about it. you know, it's yep. a company. <laughs> they smell the tough times, and everybody's worried about. It. They're spending all their time worrying about. It. I'd have an all hands meeting laid all on the table and say, "Look, the last thing I want is you guys spending all your time talking about this crap. It's it's just it's useless. Get it, you know, get it through your head that I, you know, what we want you doing. I, I want you doing." is when you're taking a shower, I want you thinking about the problems we gotta solve here. And, and try to get your enthusiasm, talk to each other, 
we designed the building at Seagate so that people would bump into each other. I wasn't as clever as Steve Jobs in locating the, the, the uh, heads in the atrium area, but I did put in an atrium with the common steps all the way up and down because I'd observed that at, at the Alcoa re, uh, headquarters in, in Pittsburgh and thought that's a very clever way of you know, Stimulating. getting people to interact and make things happen. Uh, Steve Jobs had done the same thing, I learned that by reading his uh, biography on him, uh, but he was even more clever. He put the heads in the, into that same area because that's where everybody goes all the time. But I mean, it, it, creating, figuring out how to get teams of people to work well together. And, you know, we had our, our problems. Uh, there were situations where, where, you know, people be discontent with their manager or whatever. And I operated on an open door policy. I mean, they could, people could come in and talk to me. I didn't encourage it because I think that, you know, what you want to do is help get the managers talking with their employees. But if somebody wanted to come in and talk because they really had a problem, then I wanted to, to talk with them. And then, you know, then my approach was hear them out. I'd talk to the manager individually, and then I'd bring them both together and say, okay, this is what I hear from you, this is what I hear from you. <laughs> you know, they, they, usually they're, they, they each have different viewpoints, but they probably haven't told each other. And, and uh, what I found was quite often in that situation, if you just you know, listen to this guy, listen to this guy, and then you put them together, you know, and point out to them, well, this guy says this, and this one says this, uh, all at once you, you start getting some good communication, communication and people happen, things happen. And so creating, my, my biggest challenges were always, how do you create the environment where people were enthusiastic about their job and, and would interact and, in order willing to, to cooperate happen. with each other. That's right. Uh, another aspect of your experience uh, that you might be able to share with us, uh, what are some of the, uh, your favorite stories from the industry <laughs> or from your experience in interacting? Well, are any of them humorous or yeah. can you share something with us? Well, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I thought about that, I mean, you and I had talked a little bit about some questions in advance, and uh, I'd seen that one. I, I honestly can't remember something specific to myself or my own experience. The thing is that I remember mostly that were humorous about the industry or the, the characters that existed in the industry back in its early days. I mean, Al Shugart, there's so many stories about Al Shugart there that are absolutely incredible. And, you know, he ran his, his dog for Congress. And, and <laughs> I, I, I think he came close to getting elected. I actually elected. got quite a few votes. Right. <laughs> I, I, I remember you know, that. They're, they're, you know, those are the, I mean, it's, they're more personalities than anything else than any one specific comment. And uh, I, you may have covered this uh, earlier on in your uh, comments, but uh, were there some people who stand out in your memory as having the most influence in your decision making? Uh, well, uh, career choices. Sure, uh, sure. Well, I mean, my advisor Floyd Humphrey clearly had a huge influence. I mean, I, you know, I. It's not that, you know, Floyd was, like I said, sort of a hands-off guy to some extent. He, he challenged you. He, he'd ask you questions and so forth. Uh, he was, you know, a great guy to interact with and, and so forth. So I, I always highly valued him because, you know, he was that way. He taught me how to give talks <laughs> and he taught me how to write, uh, which you know, and, and he was good at that, uh, good at teaching it. 
Uh, and I've tried to do that with all my students in the same mode. And, and to some extent, he's the one who motivated me to, you know, have this view that I wanted to go into academia. Um, he, he didn't try to sell me on that. It was just more or less I observed, you know, him and he had valuable experiences at Bell Labs and, and uh, but he was teaching now and so forth and so on and I sort of liked that. That was a nice model. It was um, a role model that's in right. that regard. That's right. Um, I mean, quite honestly, Chris, if I think back over time of people who've made an impact in the industry too, I would have and, and influenced me. Uh, another one is Dave Thompson. And Dave, and, and you did also uh, in the early days when we were getting the center going, it was really as far as I could tell you and Dave who managed to make this whole thing happen without that, the MTC wouldn't have existed, and without the MTC we probably wouldn't have had the DSSC, and we, you know, all, all of these things that have occurred wouldn't have happened. Um, Dave probably had more of an influence than you because Dave was continually, you, you went off to Comag, <laughs> and, and Dave was continually uh, the representative for IBM at the MTC, DSSC, right up through his, his retirement and could always be counted on to provide a, <laughs> you know, yeah, the no, best I, technical, I, you know, inputs we could get on, uh, you know, and explaining. He knew how far, he knew what he, what he could say and what he couldn't say from IBM's point of view and uh, maybe he stretched it sometimes, I don't know, but, but it always, he, he was a channel of I, I, information and a good advisor. And a very good advisor. I think he had another dimension. He, he was a CMU. Yes. Graduate. Oh, that's true, too. So yeah. He, he was a, a CMU special, graduate. Yes. CMU had a special, yes. a special place yes. in his no, that's, uh, thinking. That's absolutely right. And, and then another one has to be Tom Porter, because I wouldn't have gone off to join Seagate without Tom Porter. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, Tom, I mean, quite honestly, Tom uh, had, I mean, he was used to the IBM model, right? Uh, he knows development, he knows advanced development, and he knows research, even though he had never worked in research. Uh, and he understood that model. And there isn't any doubt but that that was what he tried to set up at, at Seagate when, when he came there and was at, told to try to make it become the, you know, a technology leader. Uh, and he, you know, hired, first put Nigel McLeod in, in charge of AdCon, okay, the, the advanced, ad tech, yeah. right, ad tech effort. And, and it was called the Advanced Concepts Lab yes. there in Seagate. And then he hired me to put research in place. And he, you know, so he was using the IBM model uh, and had the vision for going ahead and, and doing that. So I have to give him a lot of credit. And it, by the way, I, I made the point that Seagate first interviewed me to be CTO, and I, of course, turned down the job. Uh, and then Tom hired me to be senior vice president of research, which is what I wanted to do. But then Tom retired in 2003, and by that time I, I felt comfortable taking over the CTO's job, and which is what happened. So. Very nice. Uh, can you share with us uh, uh, any, uh, the special honors and uh, awards you received in recognition of your contributions. Can you give us some idea of, of, of those honors? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, more than perhaps I should have deserved. But yeah, I, I was, uh, let's see, I got the, uh, I was IEEE Distinguished Lecturer twice, and I don't think there are very many people who have been that. One of them I was doing magneto-optic recording. The other one I think I was doing ultra-high density recording. Um, and then I was uh, made a 
IEEE fellow, American Physical Society fellow. Uh, I got the PAIC prize from the American Physical Society. I got, uh, like you, I got one of the Millennium Medals from the IEEE. Uh, I got the Reynolds B. Johnson Information Storage Award. And uh, most recently, well, and then I, yeah, I, another thing that I did, by the way, uh, was that in about, shortly after we got the Data Storage System Center, uh, Singapore wanted to start a center in the field of magnetic recording because that was, for a time, I think the largest outside industry that they had. It was roughly 20% of their GNP for a period of time. Um, and uh, they, they, wanted, they realized that Malaysia and China and so forth were going to become lower cost places to produce drives and they wouldn't have this forever unless they could manage to keep a, a uh, you know, knowledge base in right. Singapore that, that uh, would attract the industry. And so they asked me to help them start up what ultimately became the Data Storage Institute. But it started out as the Magnetics Technology Center, yes. uh, also named after ours, uh, except that, of course, they spelled center differently, but well, yes. R-E <laughs> instead of E-R, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. And, and uh, so I worked with them for, I don't know, at least a decade. Uh, and uh, did get a, a, a public service medal from the president of Singapore uh, for my contributions there. How nice. And then uh, most recently, uh, in 2014, uh, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia uh, awarded Professor Iwasaki and I uh, the Franklin Medal for uh, having developed perpendicular recording. and, and you know, the Franklin Institute expects not only outstanding science, but also, you know, commercialization when they talk about these things. And so, in a way, it was the combination. I mean, Iwasaki, I have to say, did far more on perpendicular recording fundamentals than I did. Uh, but I, on the other hand, I think that I, you know, had a lot to do with bringing uh, perpendicular recording to market and ultimately proving that in fact it did work. Um, an interesting comment, by the way, is that Iwasaki, I think, would say that uh, we should have switched sooner to perpendicular recording because he, he brought out perpendicular recording in 1978. Yeah, we didn't turn it into product until 2005, 2006. Um, and, you know, the thing is, I, I actually don't agree with him on that. I think we did it at the time it made sense. Uh, there was no need to do perpendicular recording when the industry looked at it. And the industry did look at it very hard in the 80s. Uh, but the, you know, in the 80s, the issue for getting higher density on hard drives was how do you get lower head media spacing. And the uh, perpendicular media are rougher than <laughs> longitudinal media. Uh, there is no advantage at that time frame to going to perpendicular recording. Uh, what ultimately, you know, changed that was reaching close to the superparamagnetic limit in longitudinal recording. And once we reached that, then perpendicular recording uh, was available and made it possible. So I, I think we did the transition at the time it needed to be done, and that we did it about as well as we possibly could have done. I don't think, had, I don't think we could have managed to do it much sooner than we, we did under any circumstance. I, I, I imagine that the Key underpinnings like y you needed film media, yes, <laughs> not particular right. media, right? You right. couldn't have done it. Would have been very difficult to do with particular oh, absolutely. media. Absolutely, 
Uh, so there are other key building blocks that had to be yeah, and mature. More, yes, that had to mature in order to be able to. That's then right. Put we it needed together. the oxide. We needed the oxide media. Yeah. Okay. We the the early work on perpendicular recording, and it, and actually it's it's sort of it was surprising to me, but I can remember uh, listening, learning about the oxide media, and. The, that to us was a real breakthrough because the cobalt chrome, you had a, a, a nucleation field which was inadequate. too low, it was inadequate. So, and, and as a result, you were always going to have noise, tremendous amount of, of bit shift type noise on your disk. And the um, one of Iwasaki's uh, compatriots in, in perpendicular recording really didn't understand that. He really didn't. Uh, and I can remember in our, a discussion at one of the perpendicular recording conferences where, where he just didn't believe that you had to have a nucleation field that it, he didn't think it mattered that it was still going up when you're zero remnant, I mean at zero field. And, and uh, you know, it was only the oxide media which made that possible. And once that occurred, then, you know, all the other things could come together could come and make together. things happen. Right, right. I understand uh, uh, one of your most recent, the latest courses you taught. Uh, by the way, have you retired from CMU? Yes. Okay. I think August 31st, I retired of last wow. year. Last yep. year, very recently. Yep. I think before you retired, you put together a course uh, uh, on leading and managing R&D. Right. Uh, could you share some of the golden nuggets? Uh, yeah. The, uh, it's... It's, uh, it's a course that actually when I went back to CMU in 2000, I guess it was 2008 actually when I headed back to CMU, it took some time off between Seagate and CMU. Um, and the, uh, wait a minute, was it? No, it was 2007, it was fall 2007, yeah. I retired in February. Um, fall 2007 I went back to CMU and I was taken aback when, when I went in and talked with Ed Schlesinger, uh, who was then the head of the department, and he looked at me and he said, while you were gone the last nine years to Seagate, we uh, instituted a program on, uh, in the engineering college on management of technology and innovation. And he said, you've been uh, in Seagate as CTO for this period of time, and uh, you know I'd like you to teach a course on how R and D is done in the industry, and that really threw me for a loop. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm you, you know engineering class usually you get up there you write down Maxwell's equations or whatnot and explain what's going on. Occasionally somebody asks a question, not very often, but occasionally somebody asks a question, you answer the question, you go on, continue your lecture. And I was used to giving those kinds of, of you know, lectures and so forth, but I couldn't profess to know how to do R and, you know, manage R&D. Uh, to me, I'd never had a course except for a, a IBM puts you through a first level manager's course for a week. Uh, it, I, I'd never had a course in, in management. Uh, I, I had a lot of anecdotal experience, but I was trying to, you know, to teach that course. To me, the only way I can imagine doing it would be to run it as sort of a wide open discussion sort of course. And that, that's not only material I didn't necessarily know, but it's also uh, a style of teaching which is very different than anything that I had done before. But anyway, he said, don't worry, we'll get help for you. And, and I met three times during that semester with about, I don't know, a half dozen to a dozen faculty 
some from the Hines School, which is a business school, some from the uh, engineering and public policy, uh, various people who taught courses of that ilk at CMU. And the first time I met with them, I just wrote down a random list of topics that I thought it could, I could, I could see the need for the course, okay, because I just hired a couple hundred PhDs, right, who were all mostly new PhDs, and they were you know, some of the brightest technical minds, you know, that you could get. But these guys didn't have the foggiest idea of how a company operated or what marketing was for or, or that it mattered. You know, you, they, they, they tend to think, that, well, gee, if it's a gadget that I'd be interested in, why in the hell doesn't the company want to make it? Uh, never mind that it's a consumer product and your company only markets to OEMs or right. something. I mean, they just don't understand these things. And so I could see the need for this sort of a course. And so I just wrote down a list of all the things that I thought might be of use to the, the students. And then I met with this group of faculty and they, they, you know, made comments about the list, but they also asked about other things. I mean, one of them had a hot button of globalization. I hadn't put anything in there on globalization, but of course I knew a you lot had, about you globalization. Had I, you had lived it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so there, you know, the, the next time then I decided, well, I got to try to organize this into a course. I, I can't just have a random list. And so I spent time trying to put together this, to organize it so it was a course. But I couldn't figure out, what do I teach first? And, and I finally decided, well, I had an experience while I was at Seagate. And I started from zero, building up Seagate research. I, mean, I had to go out and find a location. <laughs> I had to hire the HR people. Yeah. I had to, you know, put the uh, IT support in place. I had to get, you know, do everything. And why don't I just go through this in sort of the chronological order that I did things? And uh, some of them wouldn't have been logical necessarily, but I could move them around if, if it made more sense somewhere else, but that way. So I structured that one basically in that fashion. And, you know, they had a few more suggestions, uh, but by that time I was getting zeroed in on what it was. And, you know, they, they also made the comment, the, the, the other faculty did, they said, you know, you say you don't know this material, you haven't ever had a course in it. They said, that isn't an issue. They said, we, we know all the books and we can steer you to all the books. In fact, we can give you a TA who can tell you where all the books are and, and so forth and so on. The trouble is we don't know whether any of the books are any good or whether they work or, or what's going on. So what you know is what, what works. What, what works. And, and so, you know, I went through and, and uh, structured it on that basis. So basically the course was a, uh, you know, list of all the topics, uh, sort of the chronology. It's a case study of what I did at Seagate, but with a lot of stuff brought in from Harvard Business Review cases or others as well, Stanford and so forth, business cases, which I could throw in to try to say, okay, here's an example of what I did Here's somebody facing a similar situation and he did it differently or maybe he did it the same or whatnot. You know, why are they different, so forth, so on, and that's the kind of stuff we talk about. So it, that really, you know, it, it's, it was a very fun course to teach and I, uh, you know, learned a lot from it myself, but, but I think the students who took it benefited in a, quite a big way too. How many um, semesters were you able to? I did that about five or six years. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. It just you know it was continually well, well subscribed to, and uh, you know a lot of students taking it. Okay, so for some of the nuggets that that I sort of learned through this whole experience, reflecting back on on you know 
ball, it, and it's, you know, some of it is industry and some of it is teaching and, and so forth. Um, there, there are a lot of different things, but one that I, I actually, I learned this one, I can remember Floyd Humphrey uh, taking this point of view that, that, you know, if what you really want to do is good research, then you ought to go to industry because you've got, you know, industry will support you and, and uh, you know, they have all the capabilities of doing things. That may be a little less true today than it was when you and I were grad students at, at Caltech, but I still think it's basically true. Uh, if your motivation is really solely the research, then go work in industry. Uh, um, that isn't a reason to go to, <laughs> go to academia. Uh, you ought to be going to academia because you really enjoy teaching. And, and, you know, teaching doesn't mean just courses. It means teaching grad students right. who are doing research, Training who are students. learning yeah. to do stuff. Uh, and so I think that's a very important thing that I look at. Um, and, you know, I've uh, heard this from another professor, but I firmly believe it, uh, <laughs> and that is, the secret to being a good professor is to have students who are smarter than you. And, and, and you know, you, you got to have the very best students uh, there. And fortunately, CMU has good students. Uh, and you don't need a whip to get them going. Uh, they are highly motivated to begin with. They want to break down barriers. They want to do new things. They, they really are motivated on their own. Um, the other thing is, and I made reference to this earlier with regard to universities, uh, I, I put it in the context of run it like a business, but a big part of that is value your products correctly. <laughs> okay? And I think there is, I mean, yeah, industry might not like to hear me saying that I think academics quite often sell their wares too cheaply, but I'm not sure that industry wouldn't be ahead if, if they didn't have more academics who really expected, you know, to yeah. get paid appropriately for what they're, they're actually delivering and then take it as seriously as I did to try to deliver it. Right. And, and, and the industry would be better off if, if all of those pieces came together like that. Right. Right. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, and this applies whether it's academia or industry, but I talked about this earlier, assemble a good team <laughs> and then teach them how to be, you know, how to work together. Uh, the, that's where I think my strength was more than anything else. It was not, it was not my technical contributions. Again, I'm proud of my technical contributions, but the things that I, you know, am most proud of are the people who've worked for me <laughs> and have gone on to do, you know, things that I, you know, didn't necessarily visualize or, or you know, create or, or anything else, but, but were given the opportunity and, and facil I somehow f played a role in facilitating their being able to to break down barriers that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, don't be afraid to fail. I mean, that's one of the, I mean, I, you know, I can remember discussions with Dave Wickersham at Seagate. Uh, and, you know, what he wanted to try to measure research by was what percentage of products, or what percentage of projects end up being successful in, in a certain period of time. And my measure would be that, my God, if, if you know, more than you know, 30% of my projects are being successful, I'm really screwing up because I'm not doing research at that point. I mean, I, and Dave, of course, is, a, is an operations guy. Yeah. And if you're trying to build drives, then yeah, you want, 
high productivity yield yeah, right. to gold, right? <laughs> but that isn't what you should be doing in research. You're not, if I were doing that, if I really squeezed that down, then you don't need research. You better just take all these people and absorb them into development. And, you know, you've, you've added not another dimension. I mean, we were only 150 to 200 people uh, in Pittsburgh. Again, there's 5,000 engineers at Seagate. What difference does it make? It's, you know, you may as well just put them uh, in there, yeah. unless we're really gonna do something different, in which case, you do it. Um, allow others to fail, okay, as well, i.e. delegate. Uh, you know, you've, you don't try to do everything yourself and don't try to micromanage everything that's going on. Hire good people and let them do the work. Uh, yeah, you gotta supervise it and you do have to know what's going on. I, I, one of the things I learned at IBM, uh, when I was at IBM, I was asked to go out uh, um, uh, for a week with Seymour Keller, uh, there were all the senior management in research. There were seven of us, one picked from each of the departments to go out in Montauk Point with them for a week. Uh, and one of the things that they, they uh, talked about was the fact that, you know, you needed to have, they, they gave us a business case actually, that, and that one of the cases, it, it compared uh, people doing, there were, you had a job choice, a, a personnel choice. Uh, and your, the choice was between somebody who was real good at dealing with people, okay, somebody else who was a bit rough around the edges with people and so forth and so on, but was real good technically. And the issue was, which one do you put in place in order to get the job done? And the right answer from their point of view, and I believe it, is you take, the, you took the one who, wasn't, who was a little rough around the edges. You want somebody who knows what it is it, that he's trying to do, right. and then counsel him and try to get him to be better at, it's easier to smooth up his the rough edges. The guy with the rough edges. Than it is to create the other. That's right, edges. that's right. And, and I think that that's, that's important. You know, and you can't, the other thing is, don't be afraid to piss people off. I mean, the, I, I see so many cases where, you know, if you uh, bring people in and you uh, uh, end up treating everybody sort of alike, right? You, you, you have a bad performer, you're afraid to really <laughs> go after him. You know who the people are you're gonna lose because you weren't willing to? You're gonna lose the best ones in your organization because they're the ones who are gonna get pissed. Right. <laughs> and that, that always happens. Uh, so you've gotta be willing to, you know, it's a, pleasing everyone is simply a sign of mediocrity and it doesn't work. Um, you know, yeah, you gotta, I, I had an open door policy, you gotta encourage your employees to bring your their problems to you, um, you know, don't be afraid to question. And, you know, I think the, the, and I've, I could point at people at Seagate who I would certainly say fall into this category. But if you've got uh, somebody who's a yes man reporting to you, either you or him are redundant. And one of you ought to go, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really true, and you know, and some people, some managers expect that sort of thing. They they, they want pounce yes on people. people. They want yes people working for them, yeah. and you know, if that right you don't do. need them. Uh, and probably it's the guy who wants the yes person. <laughs> that is the wrong one to have around. Um, you know, remember your customers. That, this goes, it doesn't matter whether it's academia or industry, but academia, 
who are your customers? I can remember telling one of my grad students that uh, referring to him as one of our customers, and and he never thought of himself as one of my customers, but but <laughs> I mean they're one of our customers. But the companies who are sponsoring the research are one of our customers, and you get you need to keep all of those people in mind. In industry, of course, the customer is is king, and everybody knows that sort of thing. But people don't necessarily think of it that way in the academic world. But we, you know, people have to. Think about that. It's whoever it is who receives your product or service or whatever it is. That one of the important ones, I think, is that leadership is, is a lonely thing to be doing. Okay? Uh, it, you need someone who you can bounce ideas off and confide in and try and figure out, you know, who you can trust, and just to be a sounding board. Um, you know, in my case, I had two people for two different purposes, so I used them both quite often in, in those situations. One's my wife, who's a psychoanalyst, and she was invaluable when I'd bring her some of the personnel problems and things that go on. Uh, and the other one was, was Jim Williams, who you know, was my right hand for, he, he could you know, step in. He, he, he and I, the way we'd handle things eventually sort of merged in our thinking and he understood me very well and so forth. And you know, I'd, if I had tough problems to go after, like I say, I was never bothered by the technical problems. <laughs> the problems that are tough are, are getting the team working right and, and handling the personnel issues. Jim was very good at, at you know, at, at seeing that sort of thing too and, and hearing you out, trying to, you know, just bringing it up, talking about it, figuring out, you know, doing those things. And, you know, in a leadership position, you've got to have somebody like that who you can Trust. Otherwise, you're just doing everything on your own, freewheeling, and discussing and getting another point of view is, is I think, critical in a lot of that stuff. So you know, another one is, uh, you know, don't be afraid to challenge the pros. Uh, <laughs> you know, even in their own backyard, uh, that you know the you. You have good ideas, and and you can make things happen. Um, and you know, again, my experience is most things succeed or fail based on the people who are driving those projects. I mean, you know, and you don't you have to take responsibility for what you're trying to pursue. Uh, in R and D, I personally don't try to oh, even with my students or in professionally at, at Seagate, I never tried to over-direct things. I, would, I might have a different technical view than the other person. I'd let them, you know, I'd pose them with, I'd ask questions which would cause them to think about those issues. But I've been wrong. <laughs> Uh, many times, and you know, sometimes I found it was quicker if this guy was really motivated. I thought it was the wrong way to go, but he was really motivated to do it. I'd decide, okay, go do it. You know, I see what happens. And if he ran it, then ran into a brick wall, uh, he'd come back very quickly and and go the way I wanted him to. Whereas if I push him down my route, he doesn't believe in it anyway, and, and nothing happens. You know, it doesn't get there. So, you, you know, it's a, it's a fine balance, but you got to somehow develop the skill to be able to, to assess those and figure out when one is, is appropriate and when the other isn't. Um, you know, optimism is a great force multiplier. You know, give me a optimist any day over a pessimist. Actually, I had um, 
you know, I wanted cam new people. Like I say, new grad students were fantastic that way generally. There was one student I had, and he had gone off and worked in industry, and we eventually hired him at, at Seagate. He's a very bright guy, um, and I knew who I was hiring when I hired him, uh, but he was, he's, he was a pessimist. Um, and uh, I don't, don't have, wouldn't have hired him, but he was so good technically that I decided to go ahead. But what I put him in charge of was testing. And, <laughs> and, and he, did a, he did a bang up job. I mean, he was, he was skeptical. I mean, he was the one who would test the, you know, hard drive, the perpendicular drives until they, you know, you were blue in the face trying to prove that they weren't going to work and came up with all kinds of new tests and so forth and so on. But that was a place where I actually found a use for a pessimist. But generally, I'd much rather have somebody who thinks he can do it and, and fails than, than the one who's always throwing rocks at whatever Tell comes you out. Tell why it can't be done, right? Right. That's right. Um, and then, of course, have fun. <laughs> Don't always, you know, take time to have fun yourself. Don't always go at a breakneck pace uh, and expect others to do the same thing. I mean, they've all got to take time to enjoy life. So, those are sort of the the nuggets from nuggets. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, your experience yep. uh, shared via that course. Yep. With the, was this start at a graduate level or? Yeah, yeah. Um, graduate student. Yeah. And one last question. Er, er, uh, what are you doing now in retirement? <laughs> As I recall, you, uh, you, 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 when you were at Caltech, I think you did some sailing. Yep. You wouldn't be doing any sailing now, yeah. would you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I am now, well, I'm, I'm doing a number of things in retirement, but yeah. since you brought up sailing, uh, yes, I'm very much involved in sailing. Uh, I, uh, in, well, you and I used to go sailing together when we were at Caltech. Uh, Floyd Humphrey would take Arnold Beckman's boat over to, to Catalina for a weekend, and you and I were his first mates uh, on board the boat, and so we got to go over quite frequently when he'd take, you know, a couple faculty members and a couple grad students and yeah. a couple undergrads over. Uh, and that was great fun. And my my brother used to race Flying Dutchman, and I raced with him when I was younger. But then we bought a place up in Maine, and uh, in 2005 I bought a 36-foot Morris uh, M36 and uh, sailed that quite a bit. Uh, the M36 is not really a cruising boat. It's it's more of a day sailor, though. Sandy and I did take it uh, out for you know a couple days at a time, two or three days at a time. Um, but it doesn't have a big galley or anything like that in it. There are some bunks you can sleep in, and there was some space where we could set up a stove and do a little bit of cooking and so forth. Um, but then, in uh, a couple of years ago, uh, almost three years ago now, uh, I bought a 48-foot Boris. Uh, Ocean Series 48. Is and that a sloop? Uh, it's a sloop. sloop. 48 foot wow. sloop. Uh, it actually, if you get, I think it's April, probably April 2015, I think, issues of Sail Magazine and uh, Cruising World. It's on the cover of both of them. Uh, it actually, it's a custom boat, which I largely designed. Uh, you know, design choices, uh, and and then you sort of tell them how what you want things done, and uh, it won a prize from uh, Sail Magazine for having the most innovative electrical systems. Uh, and the thing that's innovative about them is that uh, the a typical uh, cruising boat. Uh, what happens when you go cruising is that you sail all day, but you've got batteries on board the boat, 
and you're running while you're cruising all day and sailing and having a good time, uh, you know, at night you want to turn the lights on and you got to have the, you got to have a, you've got a GPS and electronics package and you've got a lot of things on there that, that use elect electricity. So now you've sailed all night, it's time to, to come into a port, nice place where you're going to anchor and, and uh, maybe have a beer or something and sit and watch the sunset go down. And you got to turn the damn engine on because you got to charge the batteries and you let the engine run for a couple hours. It's the stupidest thing in the world. And, and it, it, you, cause you know, it's just when you don't want to have an engine running, you, you end up turning having it on, to run right, it. having to run the engine because you got to charge the batteries. And um, the uh, design that, that we worked up uh, totally reverses that. Uh, what they do, the other thing is that uh, the only, the, generally what they do is that they run a, a generator, okay, an AC generator on board the boat. And uh, so if you need alternating current, you turn on the generator. So if you want to run a hair dryer or you want to turn on some air conditioning or whatever, you got to turn on the, air, the AC generator. Um, on our boat, it's a DC boat. And what we do is that we have a DC generator. The DC generator is nearly silent. It's a very, it's very quiet. You can't, you know, if it comes on while you're sailing, you probably won't notice it. But every now and then, you you think, oh, I feel a vibration on my feet. Oh, that's the generator yeah, running. Right. You know, it's a, you, you, it dawns on you, but you but you don't notice it right away. And and, that's and by it's diesel, it's diesel fuel. Yes, it's yeah. it's a diesel fuel powered. And it charges the batteries, okay. While you're running. While we're running, anytime it, it automatic it senses when the batteries you are getting low. And, and it comes on and, and charges. And so, you know, it's just totally run by DC, and then we have inverters running off the, the batteries AC. to create the AC. So we have AC a hundred percent of the time. We can go down and use our AC okay. stuff anytime we want to. So it's a it's a different design, and we got a little award for it. <laughs> so I applied my maybe my most practical electrical engineering <laughs> was the, the design of the electrical system right. on this uh, boat. boat. But I'm also serving on the the board of uh, Scudic Institute, is a institute which recently got started up at Acadia National Park in Maine. Uh, it's just nearby where we have a, a home. And uh, Scudic Institute is, is uh, based on national park lands. It was actually lands that used to belong to the Navy. The Navy had a submarine detection uh, facility there, and they closed it down, and the Scudic Institute took it over. And the Scudic Institute is looking into uh, if, you know, questions of both forest and marine ecology uh, and how climate change is affecting uh, all of these things. Uh, do, do studies on, you know, what happens when, if the climate changes, the berries on the tree ripen a couple weeks early, but those berries normally coincide with when a particular bird comes are we going to lose all those birds? Is the whole population going to disappear? Uh, and and things, you know, various questions of that type. And um, what could you do to ameliorate exactly, that problem? Right? Exactly. Yeah. And another, one of the studies that they did do, which was sort of I thought very clever, is that they wanted to get some measure of the uh, spread of mercury up in Maine. I, you know. We know that mercury is spread, being spread around the world from pollution and so forth. But how do you measure this, you know, concentrations of mercury around? Well, you know how you can do it in fish, right? Because you can measure, you know, that in the large predator fish tend to concentrate the 
the uh, amount of mercury in them because they eat the smaller ones and eventually you get a measure of it by catching the sharks or whatnot. Right. Well, they came up with the idea, well, if that's true for fish, maybe we can do it with insects. And what are the insects that are predators? Dragonflies. And so they get, uh, you know, during the summer up in Maine, they recruit uh, kids, young kids, uh, who are up there at Acadia National Park trying to see the park, and they'd want nothing more than to go muck around in a pond Flies. and collect, <laughs> collect dragonflies and, and things of that nature. So they get, they get hundreds of, you know, Samples. kids doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They collected them all, and darned if it didn't work. They could, they could measure the amount of mercury in it and determine the relative levels of contamination in various areas. And now this is, that it was highly successful. It has now spread all over the national park system in the United States and is being used by all kinds of people to try to understand better how mercury is being spread around in the United States. So they're, you know, they're making some interesting contributions. Not related to magnetics, but but uh, I'm having fun doing it nevertheless because of my background and and they they do have grad students and faculty and so forth involved in all these sorts of things. So yeah, I'm doing that and I'm on the board of another company who's trying to make diesel particulate filters and all kinds of ventures of that nature. It's good to know that uh, you continue to approach this world with enthusiasm yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs>